What is going on? A new DRCWR show for Monday night of June the 15th, 2020. Lee Sanders here. What's going on? As always, talking the very latest in wrestling, entertainment, and beyond since 2011. This is the RCWR show. We're streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Mixler, Twitch. Use the keywords the rcwr show happy to be with you guys less than 24 hours removed from what i felt was a pretty lackluster wwe backlash pay-per-view event i have seen you all continue to interact on our poll and cast your votes and everything and i do appreciate you guys that had cast your votes we'll definitely revisit that in a little bit just you know a little bit later on in the show and everything but I, I'm telling you, this is probably going to be one of the shortest shows that we have done in a long, long time. And normally when I say that, somehow we manage to get into a few more topics or maybe it's a case where some of you guys are able to ask me some really cool questions. And But honestly, given what we had got tonight, keep in mind that this is post the Backlash pay-per-view. Man, there really was not anything truly to be desired from this episode of Raw. And we got to keep in mind that officially, the, you know, officially this was the first WWE Raw under Bruce Pritchard, which we'll definitely be talking about because we had heard the news pretty much from Last week about how Paul Heyman pretty much was relieved of his responsibilities as a executive or you know, whatever was going on with him as far as the whole creative process goes and everything. He pretty much has been stripped uh, of that rank. He basically stepped down and he is strictly just going to be a in-ring performer. And as far as who is going to be in control of the creative direction of both shows, it would be none other than Bruce Pritchard. And this was officially post-backlash, Bruce Pritchard at the helm. And I understand a lot of people, hey, hey, you know, look what was going on there when everything was happening with Paul Heyman. You really didn't have a lot of people that were... You know, throwing Heyman under the fire and, you know, I, I, I get that. I, I, I really get that. But at the same time, when you hear that Bruce Pritchard is back at the helm, one of the ways you really look at that, and I saw this repetitive question all throughout social media, yeah, you know, well, it's, it's Bruce Pritchard. What have we got to lose? Uh, a, a lot because it's pretty much a case of, the same old narrative now more than ever, especially as far as whatever Vince McMahon's agenda is, because when it's all said and done, as you've heard many wrestlers say in the past, hey, I can come up with all kinds of cool creative ideas all I want. At the end of the day, I'm basically a kid playing in somebody else's sandbox and they pretty much make the rules. So when it's all said and done, this whole creative thing that many people love to just go on and on and on about, there's still one vision, one voice, one man that pretty much has the final say, and that is Vince McMahon. So for me, you know, I, I, I tried to go into this as optimistic as possible, but still having my respected reservations because not for nothing. And I was saying this all throughout social media, almost immediately, as soon as the news had first broke out about Pritchard being back, you know, basically he, he's now in control of both Raw and SmackDown. I said, well, not for nothing. But I seem to remember how things were when he was doing his thing in Impact Wrestling. And he didn't have to answer to a Vince McMahon. And not for nothing, but things were pretty... Eh. I'm sure you hardcore Impact Wrestling fans, you, you all definitely remember. You know, not for nothing, but it, it wasn't rainbows, popsicles, and, and, and 
yummy candy all over the fucking place when he was in Impact Wrestling. I seem to remember he alienated and irritated a lot of fans when it came to his tenure in Impact. And a lot of people were actually happy to see him roll out of Impact. Matter of fact, I even remember there was a shoot DVD that he did with Sean Oliver, if I remember it right. I can't remember if it was you shoot or if it was for Breaking K Fade. It seems like maybe it was more leaning towards you shoot, but don't quote me on that. But I, I remember him talking about that whole thing, the whole process over there with him and Impact Wrestling. I can see things to a certain degree, but everything still comes down to self-accountability. Neither, nevertheless, nevertheless. I thought the pay-per-view less than 24 hours ago was bad. I gotta be honest with you guys. I thought tonight was brutally fucking bad. I thought tonight was brutally fucking bad. Normally, I love these Raw after a pay-per-view because normally things get popping. There's a really good synergy, just everything, just fresh off of a pay-per-view. There's normally a really great buzz that just makes its way all throughout the night, post a pay-per-view. And tonight just was not that case at all. I mean, it seemed very promising when it first opened up. And look, we're not doing a full-blown recap, just, you know, overall, just overall takeaway of Raw tonight. But I liked how they opened up the show. I I thought that was cool, how they opened it up with Randy Orton. I thought for sure... Given what we were talking about on the Backlash post show, that Orton was going to be off TV for maybe a couple of weeks. But, you know, they went on ahead. They had Orton come out tonight and he was talking trash. He was relishing in his victory over Edge. Now, we had heard reports right before Backlash weekend was over. You notice I really didn't talk too much about it because I I hate dealing with speculation. I I would rather it's a fact and and then, you know, kind of go that way. So that's why I didn't talk about it last night. But uh, apparently Edge was injured in that match against Orton. And keep in mind, this match apparently was taped, uh, you know, not over the weekend, but it was basically taped some days prior, if I understand it right. And He basically had messed up his tricep. He had a significant tear. And as a result, he is officially going to be out for a couple of months. Unfortunate. Hey, timing couldn't be any better, quite honestly, given the fact that we are still in the middle of this pandemic that's going on. And until it's a situation where you can just stop by any clinic, what have you, get that vaccine you know to fight that covid uh, you know hey honestly it's somewhat of a blessing in disguise he could just spend that time with his family and and i mean not for nothing but i've always personally felt with edge returning i i've always personally felt that he really needs to be feeding off of the crowd that live crowd and everything and you know, i'm happy to see I was happy, I still am, happy to see him back and everything, but I I always felt that when this whole pandemic stuff was going, I get it from a marketing standpoint, don't get me wrong, I do understand it from a marketing standpoint, because you need all the star power that you can pretty much get, you got Roman Reigns out and and, and all of that, so you gotta get the star power where you can, when you can, I totally understand that, I, I, I get it from WWE's perspective, but for me, Personally, I just always felt that with no crowd, eh, it's, you know, just really try to make it be a limited run with him and everything. But Orton pretty much basking in the glory of defeating Edge, bringing up the tear, being all sarcastic about, hey, maybe I'll see you again in 2029, <laughs> nine years later. Oh, you know, we could do this again. Christian, Christian coming out. You know, we talked about this. If you guys had checked out the post show, again, less than 24 hours ago, which, by the way, I, I do appreciate those of you that uh, went out of your way to check it out, whether you checked out the webcast version of it or you checked it out 
on demand or on the downloads. Uh, I do appreciate you guys that went out of your way to check it out. But yeah, I didn't just say, oh, you know, Christian. I mean, I laid it out. Yeah, and it made a lot of sense how I laid it out, how you could have Christian come back and everything. And I, I tell you what, for the powers that be in WWE to go ahead and pull the trigger and say, no, you know what, we're going to go on ahead and we're going to have Christian come out, you know, right here, right then and there. I, I thought that was a stroke of genius. They could have easily milked this for a couple of weeks, but they chose to not do it. They decided to go right into Orton Christian was a, a, a damn good move. I, I personally felt, and I love Christian. I, I love Christian. I love Edge. Uh, I, it, it's weird because I've I've always appreciated Christian a little bit more than Edge. So, uh, but but it was great to see him back, uh, setting up a a situation here in that opener of Raw and in, in storyline. Orton challenges Christian to face him in an unsanctioned match because Christian is not medically cleared to wrestle. So through this unsanctioned match, WWE cannot be held responsible for anything that occurs to him in this bout against Orton. And uh, Orton pretty much telling him, look, I'm going to give you a considerable amount of time. Take the whole night to think about this. But if you don't accept this challenge, I'll know you're a straight up coward. You know, not for nothing. This ain't about you. Never was about you. This is about me and Edge. You've got nothing to do with this. But since you want to get involved in everything, you know, you, you, you're essentially fixing for one more match. You want to try to redeem what had happened for Edge. You, you want to try to take up that mantle. Okay, you got till the end of the night. All right, so there's your carrot right there to try to keep you into the show for the rest of the night. But I got to tell you, after that opener, it just went downhill. It went downhill like a motherfucker. I, I think those of you that uh, watched it would definitely agree. Let me know what you think. I've got a poll, as always, when it comes to the shows after Raw. I ask you guys, what did you think about Monday Night Raw? Got a poll that's up right now. Let me know what you think. Uh, we got it up on Twitter, at the RCWR Show. We also got another poll. Uh, on the YouTube, actually, give me a second here. There we go. I was getting ready to retweet something here. I didn't want to do that. The retweet with comment wasn't trying to do that. Uh, but we got one poll on Twitter at the RCWR show, and we got the other poll up on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash the RCWR show. Click on the communities tab. You cast your vote that way, asking you all, what did you think about Raw? So far, I'm looking at Twitter. Again, early results coming in, and I'll definitely follow up a little bit later on in the show one more time, seeing what you guys are saying about tonight's show. But I am seeing for Twitter, we have 33.3% that's giving it a thumbs down. Meanwhile, 66.7% are giving it a thumbs up. Meanwhile, we go to YouTube. Over on YouTube, 40% are giving Raw a thumbs up. Meanwhile, 60% are giving it a thumbs down. So if you have Twitter, you happen to be checking out the show while we're doing the live webcast for the next little bit, I would say, based on what you just heard, choose the poll that you feel best represents where you're feeling. Uh, where your thoughts are about the overall product tonight and vote that way. You do not vote on both platforms. Just pick the one that you feel best represents. Yeah, yeah, this is the majority vote right here. This is the majority of the voice, and we'll definitely go in that direction. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm curious for those that are, at least on Twitter, for those that are going with the whole 66.7%, I, I mean, let's really break this down. Because if you were to ask me straight up, okay, well, Lee, you just said the show pretty much went downhill from the opener. What were some of your biggest problems with tonight's Raw? I'll tell you quite honestly. And again, this is under the the Bruce Pritchard era now because he's basically handling both shows, still answering to McMahon and uh, I'm sure to a degree McMahon definitely uh, let's put this in there instead and, uh, hell yeah, that's good boss, that's good you know, whatever you want boss, I'm sure it's one of those type of deals or whatever, but 
one of my biggest problems with the show tonight was the length of the matches. You heard me right. The length of the matches. You know, the average amount of time for these matches, I mean, we're talking anywhere from two minutes, three, maybe even four minutes if you were lucky. And you're going, well, wait a minute. If you're doing matches like that, and this is a three-hour program, it's a lot of filler time that... I, let me let me tell you something. With regards to tonight, I saw more of the goddamn fucking Sonic commercial with that irritating little kid who's in the backseat. Oh, my God. Oh, and the pickles. Oh, oh, oh my God. It's so delicious. And the ways with the bun. Yeah, I, I, I'm just hearing him. And, uh, you know, I, I would have rather preferred hearing Stewie from fucking uh, South Park there. But I, I couldn't tell you something. Every fucking time we went to a goddamn commercial break, we kept getting the Sonic commercials with the little kid. That got more fucking play than the fucking matches I personally felt. Uh, but look, I, I'm going to run down the matches just real quick here and, and, and give you guys the time here of the matches because... I, yeah, I, I was taking notes, but you know, these matches, minus the entrances, you know, get get right down to it. Minus the entrances, take away the commercials and, and, and all of that. So you had Kevin Owens, who had took on Angel Garza. Yeah, and I don't really even know how you can rate these matches. You know, it's, it's like, ah, do, how do you rate this? Because it really wasn't that long. You know, you you know, scale of one to five or or one to ten. How can you really rate these matches? You know, you you really just gotta stay pretty neutral with these matches because it wasn't like these matches were good. You know, phenomenal. It wasn't like these matches were bad. It was just ah, not enough time was put in this. Kevin Owens defeating Andrade. You know, that match went about if you were lucky, minus the entrances and all that. That was probably about. Uh, you know, if not over three minutes, at, at, at definitely under five minutes. Definitely under five minutes. Uh, you also had, uh, see, looking at your next match, the Viking Raiders and the Street Profits taking on fucking ninjas. Okay, so here we go again, less than 24 hours later, and here we are once again with this stupid bullshit. With this stupid bullshit. Do you not want people to watch Monday Night Raw. I mean, WWE, what, what, what's going on here? Are, are, are you trying to alienate your fan base? Seriously, what is going on? And what may be a case where, this is such good shit, I mean, I mean you know, people on social media don't know what they want, they don't know what they're talking about, I know what they want, and I'm going to give it to them, damn it. Okay, so, see, this is why I, I wish the crowd was back in effect right now. I wish that we could just take a magical wand, bam, this pandemic, it's just over with. We can just walk in, get our vaccination shots and, and all of that, you know, get the remedy for COVID and you know, everything's good to go. Because I, I, I think the crowd more than never would be able to dictate to the WWE and the powers that be in WWE, no, this is not working. No, this is not entertaining. No, and my God, I'm I'm just picturing, I'm just picturing somebody trying to do something legitimately badass with the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders, and I, I'm just picturing Vince McMahon having that knife and fork while he's going into his sandwich because that's how he eats his sandwiches. That's Definitely how he does pizza and all that, according to uh, Jim Ross and his newest book, <laughs> Under the Black Hat. But you've got fucking, you, you've got fucking, I'm just picturing Vince McMahon just, oh, it, it, oh it, 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 let's do something else with the uh, the Viking Raiders there and the, and the ninjas there. Let's, uh, let's do something else there. Okay, so it's bad enough we've got this black stereotype thing that's going on. With the Street Profits, where they've got the bling bling going on, and 
and they're jumping up and down and they've got the fucking red cups and you know yo 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 and you know it's bad enough we got that stereotype that's going on and everything but you know most of us fans were able to look past that because we saw if we followed them in NXT we wow you know this is a pretty honestly damn good charismatic team they are fucking phenomenal in the ring man yeah these guys are fucking you look at viking raiders if you knew about viking raiders before they came to the wwe man, it's just a really great tag team great fucking tag team you know we're just gonna have them be involved in some stupid fucking bullshit slapstick fucking comedy let me let me tell you something the fucking three stooges era that had uh joe bezler uh, as Curly Joe, I, 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 you know how much I hate that era of the Stooges. I find that shit to be more entertaining than what we've got in the past 24 hours with the Viking Raiders, the Street Profits, and some fucking ninjas. You know, and, 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 and if it ain't bad enough, we uh, also got to have Akira Tozoa, again, who, who did relatively good in the Cruiserweight Tournament the past couple of weeks on NXT. Keep in mind, we've already got some maxed ninja luchador motherfuckers that's running around and they were trying to do some shit with Fantasma. I don't know if they're the friendly stranger in some weird creepy sedan that's trying to kidnap Fantasma or what. But we've got these weird motherfuckers that just keep driving up to the performance center, trying to jump Fantasma, trying to kidnap him and everything. Okay, okay, so... So we got that that's going on right now, and we're taking into consideration what just went down with Akira Tozoa in the tournament. Ah, so what's next for Akira Tozoa? Ah, well, Japanese man. Well, you know, actually, he's Korean, eh, Korean, Asian, Vietnamese, Chinese. It's all the fucking same. I'm just picturing these people in the back, the powers that be again. Oh, well, let's just put him in a fucking ninja outfit, and let's just have him be out there. Uh, let's have this play out like a very bad C-rated Japanese fucking kung fu movie. Yeah, that's what we'll do. And we'll get some big, tall, black son of a bitch uh, that's almost as tall as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We'll put him in a in a ninja outfit. And also oh, kind of like Game of Death. Yeah, we'll, we'll kind of do a little something like that. Uh, it, it's good shit. On paper, it's good shit. Trust us, it's, it's, it's going to be good. Who is coming up with this garbage? This feels like a fucking Vince McMahon move. And I'm just picturing Bruce Pritchard or whoever the fuck. You know, whatever, whatever the boss wants. Yeah. One of my favorite Wham! songs back in the day. Everything She Wants. Yeah, so in the case of Vince, yeah, it's just everything he wants is everything he needs. I, I'm just picturing, just rearrange the lyrics. That's what you got right there. We need to be done with this bullshit rhetoric with the Viking Raiders and ninjas and, and, and all this other shit. Ah, it, it, it's very, do you not want people to watch the TV? I, I got to tell you, the first hour after we were done with the opener for Orton and Edge, this shit just went downhill. It went downhill like a motherfucker. How do you follow up? Okay, so after the Kevin Owens on Andrade little spot right there, uh, you, you got fucking MVP clashing with Lana. You know, once again, they pretty much take this out to the middle of the ring where, again, we were kind of alluded to this, you know, last night, you know, what's going to happen. It is obviously, I, I, I summed it up here. I said, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing so his thing's going to blow up. He's actually going to ask for a divorce. Sure enough, that's exactly what had uh, played out tonight as Lashley held Lana responsible for him not becoming the new WWE champion. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, you know, he, he pretty much, you know, in a nutshell, he felt as though she has been sabotaging his career, kind of holding him back and, and, you know, he, he wants a divorce. Okay, so Lana left heartbroken once again. Okay, all right. You know, th that was, you know, kind of tolerable. Uh, you know, MVP, Lashley, they were tolerable. Lana, hey, I feel she didn't do 
too much talking. She did just enough. But then we take an interesting turn later on in the night because we had the match there that went down with, uh, who who was it there? It was, oh God, Liv Morgan teaming up with Natty to take on the Iconics. Man, you guys really don't want people to watch your product tonight. Yeah, you know, this, this was pretty much go use the bathroom, go do your laundry, go do any and every fucking thing else. Yeah, at one point, I just felt myself, and look, I don't want people to, you know, look at this as me bitching, because I'm not, I'm just so passionate, and I want the very best for certain promotions, and in this case, I want the very best for WWE, especially with these flagship shows, because it's not like they don't have the talent, because they do have the talent, but we need to stop doing this hokey-dokey bullshit already. And, you know, if you're going to do the hokey bo- the, the hokey dokey bullshit, you got to at least do it in such fashion where it's truly entertaining. It's truly entertaining. And that just does not seem to be the case of, of what's been going on uh, as of late with the programming. And that's the God's the honest truth. Look at the rest of these matches that we had got on the card, though. Um, again, Viking Raiders, Street Profits versus some fucking ninjas. You know, Street Profits went over. Uh, just just shitty. Uh, totally shitty. On, uh, on, on so many fucking levels. Uh, Master fucking Splinter uh, to Zoa, uh, as I'm looking at him now. Because uh, it just has a, a fucking Ninja Turtles vibe to it. I will definitely ad- admit that. A Teenage Mutant Ninja fucking Turtles vibe to it. Uh, he calls out Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Ninja, uh, to try to help him balance out the odds. Uh, I, I, yeah, Okay, so you got the Viking Raiders and the Street Prophet standing right there. Okay, four guys against one. Love those odds. Nah, apparently it's not enough. We need one big guy to face another big guy. Who are you going to call? Well... It's the big show, star of the big, big show on Netflix. Yeah, great. 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 You know, hey, look, got new appreciation and respect for big show. You know, watching his little documentary on the WWE Network and everything. And I, I, I get it. He wants to help out where he can, when he can, all that. Hey, he's got my respect. He's got my respect. He now he's at that age where he's trying to pay it forward. He's trying to do his part to help elevate the uh, new talent and everything, up and coming talent. I appreciate that, but shit is shit to put Big Show associated with this shit shit storm of a fucking uh, segment slash feud. Yeah, no thanks. Not not really interested uh, in, in that. A uh, little bit of brawling going on. I kind of found it a bit funny how. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was uh, somehow uh, separated there. He never did lock it up with the big show. You know, we're we teasing this. Is it something where maybe they're going to collide in a couple of weeks? I don't know. Particularly, I don't give a damn. Uh, doesn't interest me that that whole thing that's going on just does not interest me whatsoever. Maybe there was a silver lining in this, though, because later on in the night, big show would cross paths with Shree Prophets and Viking Raiders once again and say, hey, look, I, I know how we can solve this whole, you know, anything I can do, you know, you can do better thing that you guys got going on. Tag match between both of you guys next week. Let it be for the tag titles. Best team wins. Whoever comes out on top, you know, that that's it. That's going to solve it once and for all. Okay, great. Now we're getting back to basics. Yes, let's get away from the hokey dokey fucking bullshit already. Yes, please. Ah, Rey Mysterio, I got my eye on you, or in this case, I got both eyes on you, brother. I got beef with you this week. A lot of respect for Rey Mysterio. A lot of respect for Rey Mysterio. Appreciate all his contributions to the business. But Rey Mysterio, damn you! Damn you, Rey Mysterio, damn you! Damn you, I got it. I'm following up from what happened a couple of weeks ago where Seth Rollins took out his eye, and and your, your, your eye got taken out. By Seth Rollins, and in storyline, follow me here in storyline. Oh yeah, you know it's it's just I don't know yeah yeah Seth Rollins, damn you, damn you, damn what you did to me and my eye, damn what you put me through, 
damn what you put my wife through. Damn what you put my son Dominic and my other kids. Damn you, Seth Rollins. Damn you. I don't know if I'm ever going to get cleared, but if I do, whether it's today, tomorrow, a couple of weeks from now, damn you, Seth Rollins. I'm, I'm going to make you pay. It's like, you know, we, we see him cut this pretty goddamn... You just got to go back a couple of weeks and, and, and just check out that whole spill I put out there on Rey Mysterio. But that was just... ah. So we get... Seth Rollins trying to talk to Rey Mysterio, who is Rey Mysterio, that is, is somewhere via satellite. All right, so Rey Mysterio. All right, it's been about what two weeks with the whole eye thing. Last time we saw him, he had his mask on, and 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 basically we could see his good eye, and the other eye is just basically you know it's pitch black. He he's got it covered up pretty good. With the way he's got his max, you know, designed and everything, you're going, okay, cool. This is cool. Nah, this week there was hardly, hardly a really good effort. Who the fuck was setting up? Who the fuck was setting up this goddamn segment for Ray, for Rey Mysterio to talk tonight? Because let me tell you something. That person needs to be fired. Whoever was in charge of pre-production. For setting up Rey Mysterio, cutting his shit via satellite. They need to be fired. I'm going to tell you a reason why. I know a thing or two about lighting. Because over the years, I've had to do stuff for the show. Whether, whether it's in the studio, or I'm doing something on location, and I got to take my equipment and all that. This is what I don't know. Anybody that knows a thing or two about fucking lighting... You're going, okay, so Ray, you know, we're going to have you talk, and, and I'm just picturing Ray in storyline, oh yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, my eye is still not 100%, right? Yeah, that's correct. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so you're doing the test lighting and all that shit, you're playing the shit back, you're seeing how everything is rolling and everything, and nobody, nobody has the fucking common sense to say, Stop, stop, stop a second. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Ray, we can see your good eye. Say again? W w the eye that is supposed to be damaged? Yeah. Well, we can see it. So I if we can see it, then the people at home are going to be able to see it. Oh, that, that, that's a problem. Yeah, it, it is a problem. Well, what should I do? Uh, well, um, maybe we can get some, uh, some black tape. Uh, yeah, uh, you know what? Maybe we can, uh, take a piece of, uh, black t-shirt and, uh, maybe we can, can tape it on the inside and, uh, cover that eye part of your mask very good. That way it comes off very pitch black and, you know, yeah, but I get so dizzy looking out of one eye. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that, Ray. But look, it, it's only for about, you know, four minutes tops. You know, we need you to really, really get into this. You know, you know what, what do you say? You know, just four minutes. Just four minutes. Who, who, you're looking at him. I put the join up on fucking Twitter. And you can see the picture that I shared of Ray, you know, satellite while he's trying to talk to Seth Rollins. You can see his eye clear as fucking yeah, day. Da, da. Now, oh, yeah, da. Gino, thank you for the super chat, my brother. Appreciate that. Uh, Gino coming in with a super chat. By the way, if you guys want to throw in a super chat, you definitely can do that. Uh, again, you can put in the super chat. Appreciate it. Gino saying, don't watch Raw, SmackDown, and main roster pay-per-views anymore. The only thing I watch from WWE is NXT, TakeOvers, and the documentaries. I do not blame you, Gino. That's literally the point where we're at right now. And it's funny you mentioned that, Gino, because on Twitter, at one point, don't don't worry, guys. I didn't forget about you know we just you know, damn you, damn you, Seth Rollins. I I didn't forget that. But Gino brings up a good point because to follow up on that, I remember at one point this is how bad Raw was tonight. At one point, after about maybe ninety minutes into the show, I put out a tweet and I said, guys, hang in there. Raw is almost in the books. Tuesday night, we got a new NWA Carnyland. We got a new Impact Wrestling. Wednesday night, we got NXT. We got fucking AEW. 
you know, SmackDown on Friday, remotely good because of the caliber of talents that's there. But I will even admit to you guys, based on what I had saw from this past Friday, eh, it is all I got to say. Hey, Bray Wyatt is going to be back. First time he's been back in many weeks. Okay, I'm curious. I'm curious what's going on. I, I definitely want to see. Yeah, okay, we'll see what happens. But my message to wrestling fans was, hey, if you're not really feeling raw this week, I, I feel you. We just got to get past tonight. And then there's going to be some pretty good stuff that's going to be coming our way over the course of the next, you know, 48 hours. So just hang in there. Uh, but yeah, whoever was in charge of the lighting and production aspects and all that for that Rey Mysterio talking segment... God, take them back to fucking school and fucking school them because that was some straight up bullshit. Some straight up fucking bullshit. Uh, you know, clear as day. You know, longer than I don't know what, you, you just see his eye. And, you know, his, his supposed bad eye, you see him. It's not like the eye is just like the guy in the Who Can It Be uh music video there from men at work you know who can it be now when the eye is just one eye's going this way and the other eye's just boom, 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 all over the fucking place you know it wasn't like that you know ray mysterio is just dead looking at the camera and everything but yeah so ray mysterio has this thing with seth rollins you know hey i, I, I gotta warn you you know, my son dominic he, he's he's out there and and yeah. Uh, I'm not going to be held responsible for what he's possibly going to do to you, but, you know, I think you deserve it. Damn you! Damn you, Seth Rollins! And, yeah, you got fucking Seth Rollins teasing the idea, okay, well, unless your son is out here to, you know, maybe be part of my, I guess, congregation, if you want to call it that, you know, yeah, I will destroy what you created, Rey Mysterio. I've got no problem doing that. And Dominic jumps Ray Ray, uh, Seth Rollins, Murphy, Austin Theory, they tried to come out, but he, you know, he pretty much escapes them and everything. So you're, you're like, okay, all right, cool. Obviously not done by a long shot. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm sorry. I'm just a stickler for detail. You know, some people may not really be paying attention, but I mean, it's not like I'm sitting down and I'm, I'm taking, I'm not, I'm just whatever is coming to my mind in real time. That's what's going on as I'm, I'm peeping all of this. And that was just rather, oh, come on. How are you going to drop the ball on that? Come on now. All right, moving along. Truth, our truth. He somehow gets himself and Drew McIntyre into a little bit of a pickle where <laughs> they cross paths with Lashley and MVP. Long story short. Our truth without even running it by McIntyre in storyline, decides to have his 24-7 championship and Drew McIntyre's championship on the line in a winner-take-all tag match. And this pissed off Drew McIntyre to no end. Uh, Drew let his voice be heard to tr truth, saying, you know, I, I fought so hard to get this and do you realize the position that you are putting us in? Do you realize what we could both lose in one night because of your decision making there? Our truth, you know, hey, you know, I, I, I understand. I, I, I got you. Later on in the night, truth revealed right before their match was supposed to go down. He revealed that he talked to the powers that be, and apparently, our truth's championship is no longer on the line. However, Drew McIntyre's title would still be on the line. Yeah, and, and I, I got to tell you, as far as just bringing the charismatic aura, energy, I, I, I got to tell you, there was one true saving grace for tonight's show. Other than Christian Orton on sanctioned match, I mean, we knew it was going to happen. Other than that, I would have to say the Apollo Crews taking on Shelton Benjamin. That was a great match. It, it was a non-title matchup too. It was actually a non-title matchup, but that actually was a good match. But I got a, a serious beef to pick with that because that match was a short match as well. 
You know, and it and it's damn fucking sad. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a hot second. Your third match of the night, Natty, Liv Morgan taking on the iconics, of which they lost to those girls. You know, this this match went about almost two minutes and some change. Again, two minutes and some change. What kind of bullshit is that? You really don't want people watching this? Like, come on now. I just put over Apollo Crews taking on Shelton Benjamin. That was your next match after the women had win at it. That match, God, that match was probably about four, maybe five minutes if you were lucky. Four, maybe five minutes. Apollo Crews picking up the W. Now, in a WWE, uh, I guess a dot-com exclusive, if you want to call it that, MVP caught up with Shelton Benjamin. And this pretty much was a result of MVP uh, being turned away from Apollo. MVP came to Apollo and, and told him, we saw this on Raw tonight. He came to him and said, hey, look, I think that's admirable that you want to defend the United States title week in and week out. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to be a fighting champion and everything, but you got to be smart about this. You just went through, you know, a, a, a really, really solid match over the weekend against Andrade you know, I, I want you to wrestle smart and also put yourself in a position where you're fighting for money. You, know, you also got to be thinking about that. You got to be about that money. You know, Cruz hears him out and everything, but pretty much tells him, ah, respect, but no disrespect. I like where I'm going right now. Thanks, but no thanks. So match with Shelton goes down. And even though Shelton Benjamin lost, MVP follows up with him afterwards in the WWE.com exclusive and says to him, Hey, you know, cheer up. You, you may have lost, but I can actually get you a match against Apollo Crews. I can get you a rematch against him, and I can have it be for the United States title. Cheer, you know, cheer up, chin up. So, okay, so now we've got this alliance thing that's going on here with MVP and, and Shel Good, good. Good. But I didn't like the fact that, uh, you know, what these guys had did tonight was so fucking short. I mean, look, if you're going to have these guys wrestle, but only to set something up bigger between the two of them, I get that totally down with that. Here's my whole thing. You got three hours of a show to kill. So if you're going to have these guys go out here and they're going to wrestle, well, don't you think on paper, man, Apollo Crews and, well, hey, who said we had to fucking promote fucking Sonic Foods 20 goddamn times tonight? You know, why don't we, you know, give these guys about 10 to 12 minutes, let them do their thing? Yeah, yeah, well, we'll have them fight each other again, and maybe that next time when they fight each other, we'll let that go about 20 minutes, right? Makes a lot of sense. But, yeah, another short one uh, right here. But the little bit of potential that I had saw uh, from this, it looked as though it was warming up to be a instant classic, for sure, for sure. So uh, if they are going to be locking it up again next week or, or wherever, hey, hopefully it'll be three times longer than what we had got tonight. Your fifth match, Drew McIntyre, R-Truth, taking on Lashley, MVP. I bullshit you not. Heard the introductions. I said, oh, okay, great. All right. Well, let me try to watch a little bit of this. Man, action must have been on for about two minutes. I said, oh, damn, that was quick. Went to go use the bathroom. I come back. The fucking match is over. I wasn't even in the bathroom that long. I probably was in the bathroom maybe about five minutes. I come back. The fucking match is over. Drew McIntyre picking up the W. Still. The champion. <sighs> it was one of those nights, folks. It was one of those nights. Raw Women's Championship. Nia Jax. Taking on Asuka for the title. Here is a rematch here. Minus the introductions, this match maybe went about six, possibly seven minutes. Give or take. You had a little bit of uh, fuckery that you could say uh, with this one because closing moments of uh, of this one, Nia Jax hits a Samoa drop. Pen attempt is done. 
Asuka, her, her foot manages to get under the rope. Nia's pretty pissed off. Pissed off to the point she shoves the referee. Referee doesn't appreciate that. Says that she crossed the line. And, uh, you know, he, he pretty much was getting ready to call the match. He was getting ready to DQ Nia Jax as a result of, you know, what she did there. But Asuka comes in with a roll-up. Ref decides, nah, you know what? Let me get my revenge on this. I was about to say that B word. We don't need to say that in 2020 on this on this heifer. <laughs> How show that heifer? Does a quick three count. Match is over. And uh, obviously, this is done to keep the Asuka Nia Jax feud going. Once again, fuckery right here. You can't really rate this, folks. You, you, you really can't. But again, minus the introductions, this was probably about six Maybe seven minutes of a match. It wasn't a good match. It wasn't a bad match. It, it, it just, again, you know, it's almost kind of like, just to use a food analogy, I, I know many of you all, at some point in your life, you've, you've eaten a Hot Pocket. Nasty as fuck, aren't they? I can't stand them. If I had to tolerate a fucking Hot Pocket, I, I will do the Cheddar and Broccoli Hot Pocket. I'll do that. But whether you put it in the oven or you put the son of a bitch in the microwave, it's just... It doesn't even matter what it is. Grilled cheese, hot pocket, macaroni and cheese, hot pocket, spaghetti, hot pocket, uh, Skittles and Snickers, hot pocket, whatever the fuck it is, you know, hum, humble bigger, puckle, puckle pie, hot pocket, it doesn't matter what the fuck it is. It, it's just what you're eating is bread. It's really what you're eating is bread. But my point, to sum up all of these matches that we got tonight, you know, to use a food analogy, it's like a hot pocket. What's the instructions for the Hot Pocket, folks? It's usually, I haven't eaten it in so long, so I forgot. What, what is it? It's, uh, I think it's two minutes and, and 40 seconds or some shit like that. You, you put it in the microwave. Well, you know, let's just go with that number because that sounds like a pretty decent number. All right, so two minutes, 40 seconds. Well, it, it's kind of like you put it, a Hot Pocket, in the microwave for about 60 seconds. No, not even 60 seconds. For about... 40 seconds. Ah, it's good. Yum, yum, yum. Time to eat. It's like, nah, you gotta, you gotta really let that motherfucker cook. You gotta let it warm up. You gotta let it get nice and hot. You gotta let the ingredients, you gotta let that cheese, that chicken, or whatever the fun fuck is in it, and you gotta let it do its thing, and you pretty much go from there. And that's how I felt about a lot of these matches tonight. What may have sounded good on paper when you get right down to the fucking execution. Like I said, the fucking Sonic commercials with the little boy. Oh my god, this is so good. And the pickles and the, and the lettuce and, and, and the tomatoes and the, and, and yeah, yeah, uh, 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 you know, kids just going on and on. I, I just wanted to say to that little kid, hey, you know, he, he's up, son. <laughs> Enjoy your food. It's getting cold. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just wanted to say I wanted to go Walter Matthau uh, on that fucking kid. Y'all know exactly the commercial I'm talking about. Your main event match of the night, and at this point, you kind of know what the fuck was gonna be going down here because you know uh, East Coast time. You're going okay, 10:50 p.m. Uh, Raw goes off at 11 promptly. There ain't no overrun. Here you are taking another fucking commercial break. Yeah. Yeah, okay. This ain't gonna really be an enjoyable long-length match that we're gonna be able to enjoy, are we? You know, Ric Flair tried talking to Christian earlier in the night. Hey, pal. Hey, hey, pal. Woo! Hey, listen there. Diamond Thor forever. I can tell you this much, son. You go out there against Randy Orton. Let me tell you, I'm old thing or two about Randy Orton. Randy Orton devastating. You son of a bitch. You go out there, you do that match. You won't be coming back out live. Please, please don't do the match. Please don't do the match. You know, Christian, Yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, I got to do what I got to do. I got to do what I got to do. I, I, I get it. He's a man. He's proud. I, I I get it. I get it. Main attraction of the night. Go to this. This bout. Ric Flair comes up from behind. 
Wait, 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 stop, stop right there, swim, woo, stop right there, woo, 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 hey, hey, hang on a second there, boy, hang on a second there, of course, I just got off the forward edge, got off the forward edge, he said, he, he's okay with you not doing this, he said, don't do it, he's okay, don't, don't, don't do it, Red, calm down, both of you, both of you, y'all don't need to do this, y'all need to do this, uh, Christian, you know, I, 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 I got it, I understand, but I got to do this, Rick. Politely gestures Rick to the side. Ric Flair comes in with a low blow, a low blow to Christian from behind. And uh, this pretty much leaves him exposed there for uh, Randy Orton. Randy Orton just coming in there. And uh, taking advantage of the situation. Ah, punch Christian. One, two, three. Raw goes off tonight with Orton yelling at Christian. This had no thing to do with you. You had no business being out here. This is your fault. This isn't my fault. We were boys. I respected you and, and, and loved you, you know, just as much as I loved Edge. Gotta tell you, gotta tell you what I had laid out last night. Gotta tell you, was not how I was envisioning this going on. Talk about blowing your whole load there. And now, let's address the question. Why did Ric Flair do what he did? I have a simple answer to that. It's very simple. Now... If something was done on WWE.com as an exclusive, I don't know anything about that. So I have to rely on you guys. But my idea, and this isn't a, you know, if I was writing this, okay, I didn't, this is real time thinking, whatever comes to mind. I could see a legitimate story play out where Ric Flair says, I felt, honestly, I did what I did to Christian because honestly, I felt disrespected by Christian. I'm the nature boy, Ric Flair. I am a multi-time world heavyweight champion. I have won championships in practically every single promotion I have ever worked in. The years of knowledge, you know, the wealth of knowledge that I have, the education that I can give others. Many look at me as an icon. Many look at me as a legend. I appreciate all the contributions that Christian has made to the business and everything. I tried to go to him man to man. I tried to look at him as a wrestling peer, but also at the same time as his, his elder. And I felt he was disrespecting me by not taking in my information. Cause I got to tell you the way Ric Flair had looked in that backstage segment where Christian just pretty much, yeah, you know, to me, and it's so funny because I was telling, I was telling my girl this. I said, "Man, it, it just kind of came off as if Christian just went, yeah, I, I hear you, old man. I, I hear you. I hear you. Whatever, old man. I ain't trying to hear that shit right now. I'm gonna go do what I'm gonna do." And Ric Flair just had this look on his face, like you, you punk. You just disrespected the hell out of the nature boy. Which, ooh, you can't do that to the nature boy. Yeah, he, he just came off like that. And I just had this funny feeling that, oh, he's he, he, he's going to get his ass. He's going to get his ass. That is the honest, legitimate answer that I, that makes the most sense to me. Because let me tell you something. Uh, you know, I hate to go Pepperidge Farm, but Pepperidge Farm Lee remembers that one of the last times Randy Orton and Ric Flair were kind of, you know, somewhat together, uh, that, that exactly didn't exactly go off, uh, go off that well there from, from what I remember. Now I, I do recall Batista was one of the last people that had got his hands on Ric Flair. I remember that because this was all about Batista. Give me what I want and, and, and all that other shit. Now, if my, and I have to rely on you guys, if my chronological order is right, the last time we saw the Evolution guys together, 
it was on an episode of SmackDown. And that was where Batista had first put in the seed or WWE rather. They first put in the seed that maybe Triple H Batista was going to be doing something. Meanwhile, Randy Orton, Randy Orton, he, he didn't mind seeing the two of them throw it down. But Ric Flair was trying to be the peacemaker out of all of that. So now that I'm really thinking about because originally I was thinking Randy did something to Flair like in recent memory, but it was actually Batista. So unless the point I'm making, unless you're going to go in the direction of, of, you know, the nature boy feeling disrespected, I would hate to go with the whole, that's my man from evolution. Baby. The dime, diamond dozen man. He, 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 look at him, lady man. Woo. Isn't it? Well, he did. You ready to be hung like a horse, ladies? Woo! You know, I've seen this kind. You got, I tell you, other than riding Space Mountain, or riding Space Mountain, Randy Orton, the big whole horse cock, you know, unless, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. I, I, I hope they go with the disrespect because that seems like it makes more sense as opposed to. Going in the direction of, you know, hey, us evolution boys, you know, we've been through so much. I, I would hate for it to go uh, in that fucking direction, you know. Uh, also, talking about Ric Flair there. Ric Flair, you know, before that, earlier, we did see him with Charlotte. And he asked her, hey, you know, what, what what's next? And Charlotte's like, yeah, well, you know, I've won so many championships. And Flair's like, yeah, I know that. Now, nobody's taking that away from you. Yeah, you're a multi-time world heavyweight champion. You're, you're the very fucking best. I'm not just saying that because I'm your dad. You're the very best. But no, like, what's next? You know, there's always what's next. So, you know, like, what's next for you? you know, what, what's your next opponent? What's your next move? And Charlotte didn't reveal anything. You know, she just wooed her dad. And, and that pretty much was it. Hopefully... Uh, as far as what's next, hopefully it's going to be a case where if you ask me what I would, you know, personally love to see, I personally would love to see Charlotte slide into somehow. I would love to see her slide into that whole Nia Jax Oscar picture for the type. I would somehow love to see her slide in there or, uh, Definitely, I would also love to see her slide back into the NXT picture uh, against uh, Io Shirai. Now that she's the new NXT Women's Champion, you know, we still haven't seen Charlotte confront Io. Hey, you, you, yeah, you might have pinned fucking Rhea Ripley, you know, but in order to beat a man, you got to beat the man. Woo, you know, remember, I, I had alluded to that on the In Your House post show and everything. So, you know, you still got that angle, too, that you got to play. So, yeah, Gino, I don't know. I, I saw the funniest uh, picture earlier tonight. Like, what's next for Charlotte Fair? And I saw somebody, no bullshit, somebody posted an image where Charlotte versus Undertaker. <laughs> I said, I said, get the fuck out of here. Like, Charlotte versus Undertaker. Like, yeah, that that would be something. I, I I would love to see that. I would love Charlotte versus Undertaker. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll settle for Charlotte versus Michelle but cool. Uh honestly. I'll settle for that. But no, uh the biggest problem with Raw tonight, the length of the matches. The greatest, you know, when you when you just look at the names on the card, you're going, oh, well, surely a couple of these are you know, but we only got them out there four, five, six fucking minutes. And you're dedicating the rest of the time to fucking ad revenue. Yeah, if you want people to be changing the fucking channel, yeah, there's a sure as a hell bona fide way to fucking do it. I uh, got a little bit of a tease there of, uh, of uh, Lana and Natty possibly teaming up. Um, weird how that had came about, too, because, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, Lana... Uh, not Lana, but uh, Liv Morgan and Natty, they lost to the Iconics. And there was a backstage segment where Natty was ripping into Liv Morgan. And, you know, she was telling her how, you know, hey, you messed this up. You know, your timing was off. This was off. You know, you're still very inexperienced, blah, this, blah, that. I mean, she was chewing her a new ass. Liv just walked off. And Natty felt 
pretty irritated. She felt that for all the contributions she's made to the business, she felt totally disrespected. Uh, she's felt overlooked, blah, 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 blah. And then Lana just came along and, you know, she talked about how, you know, she felt uh, disrespected. Uh, she felt misused and could definitely understand uh, where Natty was coming from. So it almost kind of comes off as if, oh, okay, so, hmm, we got to say an alliance here. So how far is is this possibly going to go? Is Is this a case where Lana is is going to kind of represent Natty and, and maybe take her to newer heights potentially? Or, you know, is, is this going to be a case where to kind of follow up on something MVP had brought up to Lana earlier in the night? Or actually, no, Lashley did. You know, you know, when was the last time you laced up a pair of boots? You know, almost kind of taking a knock at her wrestling ability and all that. So you know, is this a case right here where in storyline, maybe Natty is going to take Lana under her wings and, you know, really mold her, re really train her. And are, are they maybe going to eventually go at it for the tag titles? Because you know, I got to say, that's that's pretty intriguing. As far as Natty in the women's title picture, uh, that doesn't, you know, been there, done that. I'm, I'm actually kind of good with that. I'm really good with that. But if you're going to go more in the direction of them as a tag team, I could probably I could probably buy into that. Assuming the payoff is pretty, you know, pretty pretty fucking good. I, I could probably buy into it. Who knows? But um man. If I could somehow kind of look at, you know, whatever positive is from tonight, great seeing Christian. Our truth just solidifies in my mind why he is the very best at what he does. Just a, just a fucking natural. Uh, truly, truly a fucking natural. The match between Apollo Crews, Shelton Benjamin, I was really starting to warm up to it. And then, you know, that was actually, uh, for what it was worth, it, it was decent. I'm not going to say go out of your way to watch it, but it, it, was, it was definitely decent. <sighs> At least WWE, if I could take another thing from the new Bruce Pritchard era of WWE. All right, so we got some continuity here with storylines and, and setting up, you know. Okay, I, I can kind of give you a, a little bit of a, of a nudge at that. Uh, but we really need to get away from the ninjas and the stupid ass, you know, stereotypes that's... Come on. You know, we, we we could do so much better. We need to. We, we could do a lot better than that. Um, rough show to watch, though. Rough show to watch. I got to say, probably one of the worst Raws I've I've watched in 2020 so far. Ain't that weird? I'm, I'm back here less than 24 hours later. I bombed the hell out of the pay-per-view. And here I am bombing the hell out of this Raw. I, I'm most curious where the ratings for this one is going to be. I'm curious what our one, two, three does. I, I, I'm, I'm calling it right now. Uh, I can see a, a serious decline. I would be very, very surprised if the numbers, if the numbers were so good that you know increase of, of three, four, five percent this week compared to last week. I, I would be really shocked to see that. To the poll, we go one more time. I ask you guys, what did you think about Raw this week? Looking at YouTube, again, go over to the Communities tab, youtube.com forward slash the RCWR show. Click on the Communities tab, and you can vote that way. 71% giving Raw this week a thumbs down. 29% giving Raw a thumbs up. Meanwhile, to Twitter, 30%. Are giving it a thumbs down. 70% are giving it a thumbs up. So again, if you have Twitter, at this point you just heard the poll from both platforms. Pick the platform you feel best represents the overall consensus, you know, your overall voice, and uh vote that way. No reason to go on both platforms and vote. Okay. And appreciate that in advance. Also, while we we're talking about polls, I did tell you guys I was going to follow up with you all and uh, revisit 
the overall takeaway from Backlash, uh, looking at the poll one more time. All right, so amongst our own listeners with regards to the Backlash pay-per-view event, Again, this is amongst Twitter followers at the RCWR show. 31.6% gave Backlash a thumbs down. Meanwhile, 68.4% gave it a thumbs up. Now, same poll given to fans via the WWE official uh, Twitter account. 21% gave it a thumbs down 79 percent gave it a thumbs up youtube 55 percent of you gave it a thumbs down meanwhile 45 percent of you gave it a thumbs up appreciate the many of you that let your voice be heard and cast your votes if you're enjoying the show so far please do me a huge favor and make sure, uh, it depends, if you're watching this uh, webcast edition on YouTube and or on uh, Fight TV, uh, do uh, hit the like. If you haven't subscribed, do subscribe so you don't miss out on all the great content that comes your way on a weekly basis. Uh, hit the like button, you know, it, it, it really helps out tremendously. It lets the YouTube algorithm gods know. As far as content goes, okay, it's actually pretty good and entertaining. You know, it helps them recommend stuff to other like-minded wrestling fans and, and everything. It means a lot. Uh, but definitely hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. And uh, for those listening or will be listening to this on demand and on the downloads, again, you know, subscribe, like, all that jazz, favorite, really helps out. Helps out a ton. So let's get into some Patreon shoutouts. I sat down earlier today, by the way, uh, as I'm talking about Patreon, I sat down earlier today uh, with Tammy. I did record uh, a deluxe. Uh, we went almost an hour long. I recorded uh, our review of Undertaker's The Last Ride, Chapter 4. And uh, wow, what an episode. That's all I got to say. What, what an episode that was uh, of The Last Ride. And uh, I'm actually going to be uh, scheduling that. So I got to clean up the audio and all of that, but I'm going to do it tonight after this show is over. I'm going to do it tonight and I'm going to have it scheduled to be released on Patreon uh, probably early afternoon. So probably about, I, I would say probably one o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to have it uh, be scheduled to go live and uh, be on the lookout for that. But patreon.com forward slash RCWR show. Check out bonus audio video content great majority of which you won't be able to find anywhere else shout out to patreon members gino shout out to gino also shout out to justin ripstock shout out to sean kenter also shout out to michael wolf john davis special shout out to my man tony bing gaming for all the very latest in marvel strike force marvel ultimate alliance 3 and marvel super war Check out Tony Bean Gaming. Tips, tricks, news, walkthroughs, reviews. He's on YouTube. He also has a Patreon paywall as well. Appreciate all of our Patreon members. Love you guys tremendously. Patreon.com forward slash RCWR show. So, you know, we were kind of talking about the whole situation there. I don't really think I need to elaborate anything more on the whole Bruce Pritchard taking over do, do I? I i i ask you all i i think i've pretty much there's really no other avenues i need to go with that um if you all feel i need to elaborate a little bit more on it let me know uh but as far as anything else i want to add to that i i mean look until we hear paul Heyman in his own words i uh, i don't think we should assume I know the way it looks right now, one can make the argument Paul Heyman was demoted. Um, you know, Paul Heyman was stripped of. There's so many ways you could look at it, or you could just simply look at it as Paul Heyman. Hey, you know what? I'm just really no longer interested in this position. 
I would rather just step to the side, focus solely on just being an in-ring character, spend time with my family and, you know, blah this, blah that. And, you know, until Paul Heyman puts some type of an official state, I really do. Because, I mean, for all we know, you know, you could also make the argument maybe Paul Heyman had a certain amount of time while he was in the position that he was in to try to turn things around. You know, with regards to, you know, the power that he did have there in WWE. But I, I, I'm not really going to speculate uh, on that. You know, it's it's his story to tell. And I think, I definitely feel that, uh, you know, when the timing is right, you know, because he's always been outspoken, so... You know, if there's something he wants to put out there just to clear the air and everything, then that's for him to tell. But we got to deal with the facts as it is right now. He is no longer in the position of, you know, being one of the creative heads. You know, we really didn't truly feel the impact, if any impact at all, of Eric Bischoff when he was supposedly doing his thing on SmackDown. I'm sure you all have seen this, the same reports that I've seen or, or heard, uh, you know, and that's hearsay. But, you know, you, you see the stuff about, you know, supposedly AJ Styles wasn't getting along with Paul Heyman. You know, and he asked for the move to SmackDown as a result. He was irate that Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson got let go from the WWE after they had signed those new deals with the company. And supposedly he felt that uh, yeah, as far as stepping up to the plate and being an advocate for Anderson and Gallows, Heyman could have done that. You know, he could have got in Vince's ear and, and somehow. And, you know, I, one thing I will say, because I, I have checked him out. I know AJ Styles has a gaming channel and everything. And I know that, you know, sometimes... AJ, you know, if he needs to set the record straight about something, he will do that. So I'm like this to those of you that follow AJ Styles' gaming channel and everything. I, I would say gang up and, you know, politely, hey, you know, can you comment at all on, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know if he has it set up where he'll only answer questions if he gets a super chat or a donation or, or whatever, but however he's got it set up. You know, I, you know, I'm sure he'll be as as transparent as possible without revealing too much information. You, you feel where I'm coming from, but you know, something like that to be lingering from the dirt sheets. You know, it it almost kind of feels like people are guessing. Uh, so you know, if there was ever a opportunity to really kind of set the record straight, you know, AJ he. He's very outspoken. He has the platforms where he can definitely do that. So um, just take all that as hearsay. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line of my message. Just take everything that you're hearing, you know, as hearsay. So, you know, look, the one thing I did appreciate with regards to Paul Heyman being at the helm for when he was at the helm, he really endorsed, really tried to push guys like Aleister Black Guys like Apollo Crews. Um, they even brought those guys like Austin Theory. Um, Andrade. I appreciate him. Carrillo, Humberto Carrillo. You know, he really did try to push the younger cats. And, you know, I, I think for all of his creative genius, his input and everything, I, I really feel that his heart was in the right place as, as far as, you know, trying to establish new stars and everything. And, you know, one could kind of make the argument Heyman was a little bit more focused on the in-ring ability that, you know, than everything else. You know, you could kind of make that argument to a degree, but it, my one biggest takeaway of Heyman at the helm for the length that he was in was the fact that he was trying to, you know, really put the spotlight on, on up and coming talent. And he did the NXT talent in 
such fashion that I've seen compared to the previous years before Heyman got into the position that he was in. And I will say he did show what I felt was as much respect as possible to the NXT cats. I, I, I will say that now somehow along the way there, guys like uh, FTR, um, the revival somehow they got a little bit lost in that shuffle. Sadly, Th they did, but there were also, you know, but again, I can I can see and I can give a nod to the good things that Paul Heyman did. However, there were lots of bad things that had happened uh, under Paul Heyman's reign as well. You know, Paul Heyman tried to go for the Jerry Springer, Murray, you know, Ricky Lake. Uh, you know, girls gone wild approach what might have worked in 1996 to, you know, 01. You know, Heyman was trying to bring that back. Take your pick. Maria Canellis pregnant. And Mike Canellis isn't the father. And, and you know, he's being pussy whipped <laughs> by Maria Canellis. Um, the Lana Rusev. Bobby Lashley bullshit that was going on there. Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch as an item. I I, I mean, you know, there was definitely some frowning moments there. He didn't really do a, a better job, I personally felt, in really building up the tag division. You know, it seemed very promising when we had saw uh, I don't know if it was right when Heyman got the promotion or whatever, but anybody remember when Aleister Black and Ricochet were a tag team? And it never was fucking explained why they were a fucking tag team. Never was fucking explained. But, yeah, there there wasn't any great emphasis whatsoever on uh, building the tag team. And you know, there was a lot of things that were just not hitting on all cylinders. And, whether or not we can truly hold Paul Heyman responsible for that, you know, or maybe we just ultimately need to hold Vince responsible for that. You know, that kind of remains to be seen uh, again un until Heyman is in a position where he can really clear the air and talk about, you know, what he did try to do, what wasn't able to go through and all of that jazz. You know, everything's just hearsay at this point. But Bruce Pritchard at the helm. Gotta say, officially, after the news, it's off to a rocky start right now. Still a honeymoon period. Let's give him a couple of more weeks and let's see what he's going to be able to produce. I'm going to give him two to three months. That's two to three months worth of shows to really see you know, where things are and everything uh, with him at the helm. You know, But when it's all said and done, just kind of follow up on what I had said earlier in the night. Uh, you know... You're still a kid in the sandbox playing with somebody else's tools, so you know it. Uh, it it is what it is there, but neither case. And see, I like what Gino said. Gino said, you know, I have your videos and my notifications. That's the most important thing you got to do is make sure the notifications are on, so you never miss out. I do see what you guys are saying uh, in the chat there. Shout out to Austin as well. I see what you guys are saying in the chat. You know, I, 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 I may be kind of, you know, I'm just going with the flow, just getting lost in the show and everything. That's that's all when it's all said and done. Uh, see, a couple other little wrestling little tidbits uh, we can get into here. You know, we were talking about Undertaker uh, earlier. I told you guys I had recorded a new uh, deluxe edition of 30 with Lee reviewing Undertaker's The Last Ride. Um, one thing that I did not get a chance to talk about with Tammy on there and it would have been uh, great uh, uh, for us to go back and forth uh, on that. Maybe we can kind of do that on a uh, episode of wrestling with the topics. But one thing that we didn't cover was uh, apparently during the, I don't know if you guys had watched it. If you did not watch it, I don't blame you, but there was some interesting news that came out of it. There was a last ride post mortem episode where Shane McMahon was a special guest and he was giving his reactions to just the overall series of The Last Ride, uh, particularly, you know, the Chapter 4 episode. And in that, Shane McMahon basically said, hey, 
I'm going to issue the challenge right now. I probably only have one more good match left in me. I know Undertaker is at a point in his career where he only has maybe just a, a small handful of matches left in him. But I am officially here on this show to challenge Undertaker uh, to another match. He wants another match uh, with Undertaker. I, I don't know if you guys had uh, had heard about that, but uh, yeah, so a challenge is out there whether or not. It will be accepted, uh, remains to be seen, uh, but uh, I got to tell you, two guys that are basically, you know, in their 50s, not exactly sure I'm that interested in watching these guys go at it uh, again. I, I think what they had did uh, a couple of years ago, I'll take that. I'm actually okay with that. You know, leave the past in the past. I'm all right with that. But, uh, you know, that that's just me. That's just me to each its own. But that's just me. I mean, I really don't want to see Shane McMahon uh, in the wrestling ring again. That, that's a tricky one. That That is a, a real, real, real tricky one. Your, your guess is as good as mine. Your guess is as good as mine. But yeah, if you guys didn't officially hear about that. Okay, so to set it up properly, as we all know, WrestleMania 32, that was about four years ago. And Shane McMahon had took on Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match. So Shane McMahon wants to challenge Undertaker to another Hell in a Cell match. As far as Shane McMahon goes... He wants a do-over, and he said, and I quote, I know I've got one more with him. I'll challenge him. I know I've got one more. I've got a big one, and I want a rematch. And last time we saw Shane McMahon on television uh, was when he lost to uh, Kevin Owens in a ladder match, and thus he was fired and removed from his position on SmackDown. But uh, again, two 50 plus year old guys wrestling. You know, would fans even want to see that? If that were to happen, you know, where are you going to do that? Are you going to do that at SummerSlam? I mean, because at this point, you do need some type of a a marquee matchup. So you, you got to have a money grabber. So is, is that maybe where you're going to do it? Are you going to do it at SummerSlam? You know, I, I will say this with regards to watching the undertaker, especially with chapter four. And then me and Tammy talked about this at, at great length. Cause at one point I said, they should have changed the name of the ap the episode for chapter four to chasing the dragon because chasing the dragon, the term was brought up a lot. And so for me, you know, well, damn, Taker, you, you've you been there. You've already done that. You know, do you really want to chase this dragon? Like, really? Do, do you really, really want to chase that dragon? You know, I'm just dying to know now how Chapter 5 is, is going to end. Uh, I won't say anymore because there was a, a lot that we covered on uh, Chapter 4, including the point uh, that I just made there, but... Yeah, just me personally, I'm good. I'm good. I mean, I'll ask you guys, do you guys really want to see that type of match? Do you really want to see those two guys lock up again? I think that's a poll that we need to need to put out there and, and, and ask you guys. And I definitely will follow up and put a poll out there. Hey, rest in peace uh, to Mr. Wrestling 2. Again, rest in peace to Mr. Wrestling 2. Johnny Walker passed away at the age of 85. As far as how he died, not really known at this time. So popular, President Jimmy Carter called him one of his favorite wrestlers back in the day. Uh, he started in the 1950s with the NWA promotion, winning multiple titles in the 70s and the 80s, including the NWA World Tag Team Championship, the NWA United States Junior Heavyweight Championship, NWA Georgia Heavyweight Championship, and the NWA National Heavyweight Championship. Actually came to the WWF slash E 
in the 1980s. But by that point in his career, when he got to the WWF, he basically was used as enhancement talent. That basically was it for him. And uh, he also had, uh, he also, uh, as far as his uh, last match, it was in the 207 Hawaii Championship Wrestling uh, for that promotion where he uh, served as a director of talent relations. He was also a member of various Hall of Fame, um, member of various Hall of Fames, including the WCW in 1993, NWA in 2012, and the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2014. NWA, they've already put out a statement, but I would imagine they're probably going to do some type of a a cool nod to him. Um I don't know how soon they could probably get something in on this week's Carnyland, you know, maybe on the following week or whatever. But I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, whenever the Crockett Cup, or the Crockett Cup comes about. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they kind of, you know, did something in his honor. I wouldn't be surprised if they even tried to do some type of a tournament. Yeah, I know you got the Crockett tournament, but I wouldn't be surprised if maybe somewhere down the line, NWA tried to really pay it forward and honor him and maybe they try to introduce some type of either a new tournament or some type of a cool award or whatever uh in his memory but yeah definitely you know this is a case right here where uh, unless you grew up on grew up in or around the georgia area you know particularly in the 70s you know 80s then you're not really going to have any idea uh, of that guy it's pretty much going to go in one ear and out the other but you know, thanks to YouTube, you're able to see a, a, a big bulk of his stuff online. So, you know, if you are one of those wrestling historians, you guys can definitely jump out there and, and check out some of his stuff when you get a chance. So big news that's been making its rounds is that Corey Graves, for no respected reason, Corey Graves has deactivated his Twitter account. And it is very important to stress deactivate because deactivate the account isn't totally deleted. Once you deactivate an account, you know, sadly, it's a position where you've got a limited number of time to, okay, you sure you want to do this? Because if your account is going to be deactivated, you know, you usually got about like 30 to 45 days. And then that's pretty much it. And to Alyssa uh, in the chat, Alyssa, I love you, honey. You always talk about Seth Rollins. I, I, I get your spill that Seth Rollins, you're not feeling his heel turn. I get it. My best advice to you, when he comes on the TV, hon, don't watch. Nobody's forcing you to watch. I, I get that you don't like it. And I don't want you guys going, damn, that's kind of... You know, but Alyssa, I, I love you. I'm not sure if it's a case where you're you're doing some type of a rewind to a certain part in the show. But that stuff about Seth Rollins, if we talked about Seth Rollins, I, I, you guys got to correct me if I'm wrong here. We've been on the air for an hour and 33 minutes. We talked about Seth Rollins almost an hour and 15 minutes ago. So... You know, if you if you want, here's the thing. If you want me to acknowledge something that you're saying in the chat, don't just post something just to be posting something just so I can acknowledge you. Now, if I call you out, I'm calling you out because I'm noticing a pattern. And Alyssa, I love you. Appreciate you and everybody else that comments. But Alyssa, your, your MO the past few times you've been in the comment section is Seth Rollins, the hill turn. Don't like it. Feels forced. You said that repeatedly. How about let's try something new and you kind of keep up with some of the topics that I'm covering and maybe react that way. Um, otherwise, if you can't do that, don't expect me to be re replying to your comment. I, I mean, that makes sense, right? Especially if you're saying the same thing every single time I'm live. You know, other people, you know, not for nothing, but other people are seeing your comments as well. So they too are going to be able to pick up the pattern. If I can notice it, I can only imagine how easy it is for the other people to notice that comment as well. So um, it's interesting that I, I mentioned that whole thing about commenting and being acknowledged. And then we were just talking about Corey Graves because it basically was 
helping me set up the whole thing with Alexa Bliss. So it's a smooth ass transition, uh, by the way, because we're still on topic. But yeah, Corey Graves, he had deleted uh, or deactivated his account. Let's make sure we stress that because there's a big difference between delete and deactivate. So when you deactivate your Twitter account, not sure how many of you all have actually tried that practice, but you essentially have 30 to 45 days. And, uh, you know, if you change your mind, you can easily come on back and, you know, it's kind of like a dating app. Basically, you can either, you know, deactivate and you know whatever. So that's basically what he's done. It's not known right now why Corey decided to do this. But I have a feeling that he's going to talk a lot more about it on the After the Bell podcast of his. He's very outspoken uh, with regards to some of the stuff that's been going on. I, I will say that he's very outspoken, whatever's on his mind. You know, he he does go there. And I have a feeling he is going to go there. I, I really would not be surprised if at this point it has a lot to do with the toxicity uh, that has been going on with social media and social media, you know, it, it can get very, very toxic on social media. You know, you have individuals, sadly, you know, they feel as though because they watch said superstar on television every single week, because they like and they retweet and w whatever with the interactions that that said superstar has on their social media pages, you know, they, they feel as though they are part of that superstar's uh, life. They feel that they are part of that performer's life. Uh, even when they are buying said merchandise of that superstar, doing the meet and greets, you name it, you know, they feel as though there is a sense of entitlement, you know, for some. Uh, and, and it can be a, a very, very uh, sick thing to see how some of these some of these fans react to certain wrestlers. I, I've had my share over the years of uh, fans that have come off to me pretty creepy in, in such fashion where, you know, whoo, you know, what the flying fuck is is. God, I won't mention her name, but there was this one girl for a series of three years. She had an infatuation with Bruce Pritchard. And I'm talking about this is around the period where Bruce Pritchard was working for Impact Wrestling. And man, I, I, I tell you what. The only time that I had even covered anything with regards to Bruce Pritchard and, and Impact, and the only time I, I ever was when I had reviewed his uh, shoot DVD that he did with Kayfabe Commentaries. And from that moment on, she would just you know, pop up and she would stay you know, liking and, and sharing anything Bruce Pritchard related, tied into him with Impact Wrestling, um, she was always, she had a, a deep infatuation with Bruce Pritchard to the point when you looked at her profile, apparently she met him a couple of times, um, at meet and greets. And it was really fucking weird because it was just a whole, it was like a shrine that she had on her page, just dedicated to Bruce Pritchard. And it was just creeping me the fuck out. I'll tell you what's even more creepier. Creeped me out so much. I remember I blocked her on the social media pages and she kept coming back with the same fucking handle. So she would create different accounts and all she would do is just look up whatever, just the stuff. She would just like the stuff that had to do with Bruce Pritchard. And, you know, there is that level of sickness that's out there uh, with, with people. Uh, and it's quite sad to see that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Corey Graves at one point, you know, reached out to Alexa Bliss over, you know, what had went down with her last week. I, I know by now you guys had pretty much heard about that and everything. But for those of you that, you know, maybe were a, a little bit disengaged from social media, Alexa Bliss, she now has her Twitter account on private. It doesn't matter to me because I've never followed her. Uh, on Twitter. Um, I'm not interested in following her on Twitter. That's not a personal attack at her uh, in any type of fashion. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm 
I, I'm just not interested in in seeing her stuff outside of the ring. I'm, I'm, you know, she doesn't. There's nothing for me. You know, teach its own does nothing for me though. But uh, just to kind of you know recap a little bit on what had happened with her uh, over the weekend and and how things had got set up, where her Twitter's now on private. Now, one thing I want to keep have you guys keep in mind. Her Instagram account, that's still open. That's still open. So, and, and Sally, as we all know with Instagram, you know, your shit, you know, people can still fucking, now you, you can make that, you know, a private account as well. Your Instagram account, you can make that a private account as well. But she hasn't done that yet. Uh, I don't think she is. But there was this sick fan, and, and this is weird too, because one week we had the shit that went down with JD, and I see there's some new controversial shit that's going on. I'm not even touching that. I mean, that's that's his flame to to uh, to put out there. But there was a fan on Instagram. Um, I'm not going to even mention this guy's handle. I, I hear he's been deleted. His, his account ultimately had got in trouble. Uh, but this is the type of stuff that I'm talking about from some fans here. You got this one fan that said to Alexa, to Alexa Bliss here. Uh, leave me alone. She said this to this one fan. You know, this guy goes, there we go. Uh, much appropriate for kids. Uh, Alexa Bliss better cover up. No one wants to see your 60-year-old face and body. Come on now. Let's be a bit more respectful. Alexa Bliss, you know, leave me alone. Guess what? You treated me like shit when I was a fan. Dedicated myself as a fan for nearly five years, but seeing it as of late, you've been liking the same fans over and over again. I'm sick of this shit. Do you know how mentally damaged you did to me? If you actually appreciated me as a fan, I wouldn't be the person I would have turned out to be today. Think about it. I mean, you know, you, you, you hear that and you're like, uh, what the flying fuck here? Now, the way this all had got pretty much popping with Alexa Bliss, sadly, uh, she was being harassed by a small group of people on uh, social media who were uh, angry at her for not being pu uh, public about some relationship that she's having or maybe not having, but some relationship with a singer by the name of Ryan Cabrera. And a fan had shared screenshots from Bliss's Instagram account where couple of individuals went after her uh including the one that you know said that they were mentally damaged by her and everything and what have I always told you on this show I've always said to you guys on this show and it's been a recurring theme I don't give a fuck who is dating who you know if it's a case where you know said wrestling couple wants to put out some type of a statement, you know, hey, that's one thing, I'm not going to pry. It's not my business. It's nobody's business. You know, that's that's theirs. What I care about is what they do in the ring. Of course, I care about their safety and their well-being. I hope that they never put themselves in a position where they come in harm's way. For sure, when they're outside of the ring, yeah, you know, I wish nothing but the very best for them. I know for a lot of those performers, uh, they are on the roads a lot. They're in rented cars, or uh, you know, maybe they're uh, maybe they're uh, ride sharing, you know, with fellow colleagues, and it's a lot of hours that they're putting out there on the road, and and weird things can happen. Uh, look at the unfortunate situation that had happened there with Hank Williams Jr.'s daughter uh, over the weekend. I told you guys I would uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. And, you know, again, uh, she had passed away in a tragic car accident over the weekend. Uh, she was in an SUV, if I remember it right, dead uh, at the age of 27. And you're just like, whoa, what, what the fuck? You know, when, when you hear shit like that, 
um, you know, so strange things can happen, you know, I, but I sincerely, you know, it's like, I hope for their well-being outside of the ring. I definitely hope for their well-being while they're in the ring and, and they're in the ring and they're performing for us, for us fans, you know, outside of that, you know, what they do when they're not in that ring entertaining us, that's none of my business. That is none of my business. If a wrestler, you know, goes to their social media account and they decide to share, hey, I want to share with you all publicly that for the past two years, I have had a drug addiction and I'm trying to do my best to clean myself up and get help. Please keep me in your thoughts. Please keep me in your prayers. Then, oh, okay, they're being open. Then I'm going to do my very best to, hey, sending you nothing but, you know, thoughts, prayers, you know, hope that you're able to get through this you know, one day at a time, you know, blah, 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 blah. And especially if it's something that I feel I can definitely relate to from personal experience, you know, uh, whether it's, it's a scenario where it's affected me directly or indirectly because it affected somebody I know, you know, if I can somehow offer some type of expertise or, or whatever, some type of words of wisdom, you know, you know, that that's one thing and everything, but they've got to be the first to openly come out there first. I'm not going to pry. That That's the mentality that I've always had. And I think that's the mentality that a, a, a lot of these uh, fans, for the most part, the majority of the fans do, you know, they do have that. But you also got that, that area of fans that feel that with the power of social media in 2020, of the entire world comes to you in the palm of your hand. You know, you are, boom, right there in somebody else's life. You know, my girl, I, I love my girl tremendously. All the time, I see her wrapped up in Facebook. I can't, you know, Facebook, I use Facebook primarily promote the show. I got my business page. I promote the show. I'll, you know, I'll post some funny stuff on there or whatever, but... I'm pretty much everything is just show related. And my girl, on the other hand, you know, it's just Facebook, 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 all her news is a lot of times. And you guys know that guy, Facebook, Facebook, it could be a weird ass rabbit hole that you're going down. Oh, did you hear about blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Where'd you read that from? Was that from a reputable news source? No, I, I think so. Why? Uh, well, because you know, blah, 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 blah. so you, you know, if it ain't from New York Times or Wall Street, or you know, you get the point. But you know, I've I've seen how social media can uh, affect the ones that I love, like my girl. You know, she's she stay in golfs in Facebook. You know, sometimes I ha I have to pry the phone out of her hands and say, you know, just put that down for a little bit. Let's en enjoy this TV show or let's enjoy this movie or. You know, it could be addicting social media, especially when you're given the platforms like the Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, Twitter, you know, and Instagram. And you're following these people and you feel as though you're right there in the living room with these people and everything. You know, you kind of got to catch yourself because when you're so engulfed into another person's life. And you know, you're caring about what's going on with them more than what's going on in your own life and getting yourself where you need to be in your life. That's a significant fucking problem. And that's for real. And, you know, hearing what was going on with this particular fan that was coming at Alexa Bliss. Let, let me tell you something. And I've always said this on the show since 2011. You know, when I critique a wrestling promotion, when I critique a performer it's never personal because at the end of the day i don't know these people even if i did you know know these people i, I wouldn't broadcast it you know there's some people that i know and i don't broadcast it i keep that shit on the hush on the hush and like i i never truly understood why some people feel the need to that they have to be engulfed in, in other people's lives like that, you know, maybe because there's nothing really constructive and significantly positive 
that's going on in their own lives. And, and that's why they feel they got to do what, you know, they got, I, I don't know, or maybe it really just comes down to a sense of entitlement or whatever. I, I don't know. I try not to make sense out of it because when I start making sense out of insanity, I find myself having going through that rabbit hole and uh, okay, I got to pull myself out before, you know, if I try to wrap my brain around why people are reacting a certain way, but to see this fan take it to the level that he did, I, it, it's really weird. It, 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 it's beyond weird. It comes off very creepy, you know, so what, because, you know, this person wasn't liking your stuff enough, retweeting you enough, favoriting your comments enough, replying to you enough, you know, and you feel that you've wasted X amount of, you know, it's weird because I was in one forum where I was just going through the comments and um, I was interacting with a couple of people about what had went down. I, I was in a, a couple of different forms and um, I was telling somebody, I said, my God, the way this guy comes off, you know that, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that teenage girl that got killed in the fucking uh, 80s. And she actually was supposed to go on to be in Godfather 3. And uh, she sadly, you know, she was killed before she could, you know, even make that happen and the role ultimately went to Francis Coppola's daughter Sophia Coppola and um I'm trying to think of um I think her name her her name will come to me in a, in a little bit uh but the story with her she was this you know pretty popular she was on the rise uh she was a a teen actress and she was trying to do her part to really to really break the mold. She was trying to reach that next tier in her acting career. And there was, you know, one movie that she had did, you know, that was, eh, it might've been a little, you know, risque or whatever. Rebecca Schaefer. That's the, that's the girl's name that I'm thinking of. Rebecca Schaefer. Look her up. There, there's been many stories that's been done about her, you know, over the years. Uh, when you look at her, you go, wow, you know, she was pretty drop dead gorgeous, you know, wow. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, she, uh, met up with, you know, Francis and he was like, look, I want you to read the script for the Godfather three. And, you know, I want you to tell me what you think of it and everything. I, I really think you'd be great for this part. And there was this deranged, you know, serial killer that first had came across her, whatever the TV show was that was short-lived that she was on, that's how he pretty much had came across her. And, you know, he would constantly write letters to her and everything. Well, there was one letter that he wrote, you know, she responded back to it and everything, you know, doing the typical, hey, thank you for the kind words, thanks for your support, love you so much. He took it to that next fucking level, you know, you know, we're an item. Never even met this person. <laughs> Never even talked to them. <laughs> I mean, you're not even fucking pen pals. Yeah, but hey, we're an item. And there was one particular movie that she did where she had this intimate scene. I, I can't think of the name of the movie right now. But when he saw this, you know, this is where reality and you get what I'm saying, you know, fiction and nonfiction. This is where the line really begins to blur like a, cool ass nine inch nail song that I love. You know, this motherfucker gets fucking pissed to no end. You know, he's already mentally unstable and he decides to take it to that next level. And when he sees her have this intimate scene in this movie, oh, she's fucking cheating on me. She's, she's fucking dead. Uh, that moment on, he decided he was going to kill her. I remember at one point he uh tried to go to some some studio grounds compound. Um he was trying to kill her, but you know, they they turned her they turned him away. Uh so he was unsuccessful. And somehow he found out where she lived. And the day 
of when she was supposed to get the Godfather script. She was very excited for it. You know, she felt that, especially, you know, with with regards to, uh, with regards to, you know, Godfather 3, just, you know, hey, you know, this is Godfather fucking 3. You know, I, I get to be in a movie with fucking Al Pacino. I, I get to be in a movie that's directed by Francis Ford Coppola. You know, no, not that many people have that type of bragging rights. This can really help take my career to that next level and everything. You know, she was very excited because she couldn't wait to get this script. Uh, Francis had his people, you know, we'll get it out to you next day, two day or whatever. And um, she heard a, a buzzing uh, at the door. So she's, oh, hey, the script is here. Great. You know, so she, you know, races downstairs and everything, uh, thinking that was the fucking script and everything. And uh, met the guy. He pulled out a handgun, shot her in the chest at point blank range. She was pronounced dead 30 minutes later. So we got some, you know, mentally deranged people that's out there. And I got to tell you, when I was reading this stuff from this guy to Alexa Bliss, it, it was, now you understand the connection there. It reminded me so much of the Rebecca Schaefer situation from back in the day. And uh, like I said, there's been many documentaries, things that's been done on Rebecca over the years. So all you got to do is just type in her name in a Bing Google search. Maybe you can even find something on YouTube. Schaefer, you spell S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. Uh, Rebecca Schaefer. And I'm telling you, as soon as you uh, look at the you know picture of her, you go, wow, you know, she she was she was beautiful, Lee. Like, yeah. yeah and Lord only knows what would have happened with her if uh, that shit didn't go down with that guy um some people have no lives sadly some people have no lives some people you know through these celebrities that is their escape this make-believe world you know it's their escape it's sad but it's true especially when one doesn't have anything really going on in, in their own lives anything that's you know really constructive it's easy to get lost in a in a rabbit hole where, you know, I, I wish I could come on here and I can say, you know, hey, look, when it comes to social media, and, I, and I've told you guys before, I've told you guys, I've said, hey, when it comes to me following other people on the social media platforms, I don't do that follow back for follow back shit. No, you know, you got to earn my follows. I got to weed you out. I got to make sure you're actually sane. I got to actually make sure you're okay, cool fucking people that, you know, okay, I'm not going to have any problems with you whatsoever, you know, okay. You know, and most importantly, what you're posting, you know, I, I relate to it. I'm feeling what you're talking about on your social media feeds, you know, you know, it's got to be a mutual thing, uh, basically. You know, fuck that whole follow for follow shit. Yeah, I remember a long time ago, um, there was there was one listener of the show who thought that because he felt I never reacted to this was some years ago. Years ago. I, I mean I was probably three years into the show. This isn't long winded either. But I remember I was three years into podcasting and there was this one fan that would always try to get my attention. On social media. It was one of those, you know, look at me, look at me type of deals. And whenever I was watching the shows or whatever, this person felt that they had to respond. You know exactly the type of people I'm talking about. You get the, that one type of person on, on, on social media that feels as though they have to respond to every single fucking thing that you're saying on your timeline. Every single fucking thing. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, it's, okay, let me give, let me give a little heart. Let me give a little like or retweet just to show that, you know, I did see that and everything, you know. And I remember, uh, there was, you know, I'm usually just, as I normally do, I'm watching the shows or whatever. And I remember 
somebody had said something that was really fucking funny. And I remember I had fucking responded to them and I had said, oh, yeah, hey, that was a fucking good one. You know, blah, 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 blah. And then they had came in and, you know, they tried to same person that was responding to every single fucking thing. They tried to inject themselves in the conversation. And, you know, it was kind of like, you know, OK, I get it. This person's kind of lonely, you know, you know, what have you. And so I, I, I just I just ignored and I, I just kept it moving along. And then the next thing I know, I actually had received the email. And this person went on this long ass diatribe about how offended they were that I was responding to you know every other person but I wasn't responding to them and it was kind of like wait a minute now are we in a relationship or something like am, am I fucking you or something because I, I didn't get the memo yeah, and I wish I could say it was a quick 30 second read of the email that I got but I mean this shit was like I, I bullshit you now I should have saved it too this shit was like four fucking paragraphs. Four fucking paragraphs. And it was, what the fuck? What the flying fuck? Uh, weirdo, yeah. And those type of people are on social media. Those type of people are sadly on social media. Yeah, and when it gets to that point where you got somebody that's kind of acting like that because you're not responding to every single thing that they put out there, it, 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 obviously that person is really crying for attention. I, I'm like this. I'm like this. It, you know, if if your livelihood, as you know it, is hanging off of being acknowledged by somebody on social media. Every single time you post something or every single time they post something and, and you got to feel that you got to be acknowledged, your existence has to somehow be acknowledged. OK, well, one, maybe you should get off social media. Two, you know, go put yourself on a nice pair of clothes, maybe go to a bar, go to a restaurant, see who's maybe having a party or something or you know, go to a club, something. And, you know, maybe that way you can meet some people. It's okay to mingle, you know, um, or, you know, that, that's, now that's one way you could try to make some friends. You know, another cool way, if you're into the video games, you know I mean, load up your favorite video game, go into a fucking multiplayer mode and, you know, hammer some shit out, what, whatever. But I don't blame Alexa Bliss for making her account private um, is quite sad. I mean, you're not going to find me bashing what she did. Um, not at all. Um, I think uh, what she did, I, I think anybody in their right mind, uh, Reese, what is up with the laughing emojis? Because I'm not saying anything funny uh, right now. Uh, I wish I could go Joe Pesci and, and say, am I, you know, do you find me amusing? Do you find me? No, what I'm speaking right now, you know, there's a time to be serious. There's a time to be funny. Right now I'm being serious. You know, there's, there's nothing funny about that. You know, seriously, if, if your livelihood is depending on social media, you know, maybe it's time for you to disengage and try to get back out there into the real world. I, I get it. It can be a drug. It can be a drug. You know, one of the main reasons why I don't play video games as much as I used to anymore is because it would be so addictive. You know, especially going into whatever, a uh, multiplayer mode or whatever, or a really good RPG game and, and just get lost and lost in... And just be disengaged from your friends, your family. You know, knock on wood, I, I never had it as bad as some of my friends. You know, you know, and, and Reese, I, I appreciate that. I wasn't, I, 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 I purposely put you out there because I wasn't sure if you might have been a different Reese or somebody else. That's why I kind of put you on the spot. I, I know you're the, you're the. Reese I'm thinking of because I wasn't quite sure 
But yeah, no, I, I that was just a test. I'm just testing you. You're good. You're good. But no, like for me, um, I wish I could say, you know, just like with the gaming, I, I wish I could be here tonight and tell you guys all the people I knew kind of operated like me and you know they didn't get that engaged in something like gaming or whatever you know I, I had a friend he lost my friendship as a result but I, I had a friend all he would do is gaming he would probably sleep four hours at most multiplayer multiplayer gaming I, I think back then he was doing the first Gears of War that's all he would do. And it got to a point where he was working, had a really good job. First, showed up a couple of minutes late. Then, hour late, two hours late. Then no call, no show. Then eventually never returned to work. And uh, I, I remember I, I got into it with him. I remember I yelled at his ass because I was just so disappointed with where he was in his life. And, you know, the house that he was sharing uh, with uh, with my friends, you know, because I, I had went to go uh, stay with some friends for a little bit. And, and because he wasn't doing his part to carry his weight. That house that my friends had worked so hard to ultimately obtain. They had their dream home. You know, they ultimately had lost it. Because my friends were doing, you know, because I think at that point, I think they were married to each other. They did what they needed to do. Or maybe they were about to get married. I think they were engaged at that point. They were doing what they needed to do, work-wise. You know, they were trying to help me in the process of uh, find work out there. But then the situation had occurred where, you know, I was able to you know, go back south or whatever. But, you know, he, he didn't pull his weight. All he did was gaming. You know, it's, it's very easy. Just like I'm sure some of you guys can relate. Just like with the gaming, social media, it can be very addictive, very addictive. And I truly believe more and more and more. I, I really just can't help but think about the Marl Ronaldo interview uh, that was done earlier this year where Marl was talking about just disconnecting from social media altogether and just being done with it because of the toxicity that comes with it. There is a lot of great toxicity. You could be minding your own fucking business and it comes to you, the toxicity. You could be saying something that is straight up, down the middle, very diplomatic. You could be truly unbiased as possible, not picking a side. And there still, somehow, the toxicity, it always comes your way. Somehow, it ultimately always comes your way. There's a lot to be learned from what went down there with uh, uh, Alexa Bliss and, and, and applied to her own uh, situation. Um... My thoughts really go to her because I, I know she dealt with an eating disorder and, you know, she deals with depression and, and other shit. <sighs> mm. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. But that guy, I, I hope he gets the help that he needs. You know, if he's that fucked up in the head uh, from what he had said, I, I really hope he gets the help that he needs. And that's the guy's the honest truth. Moving on to a little bit of a of a lighter note here, of a lighter note. Roman Reigns had put out a statement through a cameo, it looks like. You guys know about cameo. Uh, he put out a little bit of a statement basically talking about how he is family, uh, even friends, but mainly him and his family. They really are going through the motions of this quarantine and trying to do their very best for safety measures to protect themselves as best as humanly possible. But he also talked about how he can't wait to get back in the ring. Uh, he said in the video that he posted, I'm sticking to a legit quarantine and we are staying away. Or, correction, we are staying in lockdown for many reasons, not just myself, 
but my family and my community and to be able to set that example. But, you know, hopefully we'll get back to normal soon and I'll be whooping everybody's ass soon. I'm sure everybody's like, why won't he come back? When's he going to come back? Then when I come back and destroy everybody, they're going to be pissed. But it's all good because I'm the best. Yes, sir. So, you know, you see the stories that's going on. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to make themselves sound good. Oh, well, the hope is that, you know, Roman Reigns will be interested in working with WWE again when, look, let me let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Given what happened with Roman Reigns and, you know, getting his leukemia back in remission, you know, his, his young kids, older family members and everything. Let me tell you something uh, again. I can't believe I'm saying this again, but until a situation can occur where you can just walk into any clinic, go to your nearest pharmacy, go to a hospital. Hey, I think I got COVID. Okay, let's test you. All right. Yep. You got it. All right. Here we go. We're going to give you this. You're good to go. Uh -uh. Until that vaccine is officially rolled out. When you got shit like that, that's going down. You got to play a smart for yourself and for your family. That's the God's honest truth. Trust me. I I love, you know, what I love to see Roman Reigns back, especially during these, these difficult times right now. I would love to see him back. I, I I would. The roster, God, God, it it it's screaming Roman Reigns right now, and a few other people, but definitely Roman Reigns. One thing I've always said about Roman Reigns over the years, and I've always been consistent. Hey, Roman Reigns, he's got a match. When have you ever known Roman Reigns to pull off a shitty match? I've never ever shitted on a Roman Reigns match, never. I think the lowest I've given for a Roman Reigns match was maybe three stars or, you know, that would from a five point scale, basically be like a five out of five, basically, you know, like five out of 10 if you were to kind of expand it. You know, so for me to say three out of five, I'm looking at it as an average match. So basically put that on a 10 point scale. I'm basically saying, eh, five out of five wasn't anything special. wasn't bad. It was an average match. But a few times he's pulled in, many times over the years, he's pulled in four-star matches. I've, I've never, ever shitted on a Roman Reigns match. But I'm old enough, I'm wise enough to take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, nah, man, health comes first. Your health, your family comes first. I'm not saying anything that I don't practice myself. My girl had went out a couple of weeks ago. Something had involved her mom and, and somebody was having a birthday. I can't remember what was going on. But the gist of it, somebody was having a birthday and my girl decided she was actually going to go down, celebrate this birthday. And I'm saying, whoa, you really sure about that? You, you, you really sure about going out there? And, you know, I mean, and at this point, we didn't even have phase one yet we didn't even have phase one yet I'm like you sure this is wise to do because xyz she's like oh yeah you know the birthday da, da, da. i'm like and i told her straight up i said i wish you didn't commit yourself to that because you know we're in the middle of a pandemic right now and if you come down with something you know that that's all of us and i, and I reminded her i said hey you know not for nothing i said not for nothing I'm a type two diabetic. I'm like, so my immune system is a little, you know, like you got to think a, a little better next time. It's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I said, well, make sure you're wearing your mask. Make sure they're wearing their mask. You know, try to limit physical interactions, you know, try to keep it at, at minimum to really zero and make sure when you come in, whatever clothes you're wearing, put them by the door as soon as you come in take them all off put them by the door you know 
wash him immediately and you know go hop in the shower and it's like we're we're just gonna have to you know evaluate you for the next 14 days you know i hope that you know you're okay and luckily when this happened this was before phase one went down and her and all her colleagues were able to go back to work and everything this was like weeks weeks before and uh knock on wood you know everything had turned out to be okay and everything but like I like I just said a couple of minutes ago, I, I wouldn't be saying anything as far as best advice and all that shit. I wouldn't be saying anything that I'm not practicing myself in my household. I'm sure that there's a lot of younger fans that are clamoring for their favorite superstars like a Roman Reigns and, and Sir Whoever. You know, oh man, would like to see them come back, you know. But you know what? Health, safety, well being first. We could be here all night talking about all oh, this scenario would be perfect for Roman Reigns to come back in. And, oh, man, if he can just come back by this time, this would be great because we could be there, you know, all night going through all kinds of cool scenarios. But you know what? That don't mean diddly squat. This is the bigger picture that you all need to be looking at, especially with regards to Roman Reigns, since we were just talking about him. When Roman Reigns does decide to return, He's going to be returning because he feels, okay, now is the time from a health standpoint, from everything that's going on in the world with this pandemic. I feel that, all right, we're good. I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. We can do this. That's the first thing that's going to be registering in my mind. Whenever I do see him back in the company, you know, he will be back. As far as when, any dirt sheets and any reports that you see that's out there, ultimately, those are just people that's guessing. And that's the God's honest truth. Those are people that's just guessing. So you kind of have to keep that in the back of your mind. Want to send a uh, speedy recovery and best wishes to Jinder Mahal. You know, we just saw this guy come back in April, and it looks as though he is set to have knee surgery. That's going to be putting him out of action once again. Uh, looks as though, uh, according to uh, Wrestling Observer, so you, know, you take that to the bank and you can cash it. It's just pretty accurate. Uh, they're basically saying that Mahal has uh, surgery scheduled for this week in Birmingham. Originally, it was being described as minor surgery, but the damage was said to be more significant than expected. So, looks as though he's going to be going out once again. Uh, yeah, it's pretty sad to hear. I'm not even sure how many of you guys had actually even really realized that Jinder Mahal had been off TV for a, a little bit there. But I, I know I was kind of thinking about it earlier today, believe it or not. And it was, hey... You know, wait, wait a minute here. Hey, I finally had watched DC Infinite Crisis over the weekend. It's funny, too, because I had got through part one and two, but I didn't finish three, four and five. So over the weekend, I'm just going through stuff on the DVR. I'm like, wow, I didn't watch this yet. Finished it out. Eh. <laughs> That's all I got to say. But, you know, hearing the news about... um the girl that was Batwoman, hearing that she had left, uh, what, what's her name, Ruby Rose, you know, hearing that she's stepping away from the role and everything, um, hey, you know, it is what it is, this is wrestling related, so stay with me, but apparently, Sonya Deville, she's saying that she's uh, working on trying to get a Batwoman audition, with the producers, you know, director and, and people involved at the uh, CW. She recently had gave an interview and she talked about how the whole process had first came about. She was just minding her own business on her Instagram account or whatever. And a fan, you know, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so is no longer Batwoman. And she couldn't believe it. She thought it was a hoax. And she researched it herself. And it turns out, you know, that was legit. And... She actually liked the idea that the fan had put out there about, hey, well, why not Sonya Deville step into the role of Batwoman? 
And uh, the question was asked, okay, so, you know, you're, you're actually interested in, uh, in, a, in an acting role? You, you know, you, you've always been interested in acting? And so he's like, oh, yeah, you know, definitely. I've always been interested in it. And uh, it was pretty smart with regards to the lining of questioning for the interviews and everything. And one of the questions that was asked of her was, you know, hey, you concerned about how this may affect your wrestling career? And she was pretty honest. She said, you know, it hasn't really, you know, gone, you know, that that far just yet. I'm just in the preliminary stages right now and reaching out to them. You know, who knows what could possibly happen. But, hey, the WWE, working with them, that's definitely a priority right now. It's number one. But, you know, people film movies all the time, television shows all the time. I might be working for WWE, but nothing is impossible. So, you know, you kind of hear it out. You're like, oh, okay. And then the next follow-up question, okay, so WWE, you know, are they backing you? Are they lending you support in potentially securing this role? And she didn't confirm or deny. All she said was, I think they would be on board, but yes, it's early stages right now so she's just trying to get the ball rolling uh look i think she would be pretty good honestly I, from what i've seen and i gotta tell you something i gotta be honest with you guys i watched um when i was watching infinite crisis you guys gotta forgive me i never invested in arrow and i watched uh the arrow episode that was part of infinite crisis and then I watched the last, what, two or three episodes of Arrow. It, it, just by that final episode of Arrow, I, I couldn't help but go, damn, this is what I've been missing all of these years with regards to Arrow? Like, are you serious? And so now I'm, okay, I need some Netflix or something. I, I need to catch up on Arrow. Because uh, for me, I, I, I gave up after Smallville. I didn't like how they did... Tom Welling's Clark Kent Superman for that final episode and I just vowed never again I'm not watching like fuck this but the girl that they had to play uh, Batwoman I, I liked her I, I thought she was pretty good I think Sonya just she looks the part she's already got the physical aspects down and, and, and all of that I think she'd be great um, the acting you know, sometimes we can look at some of these shows and we can go, well, not for nothing, but it's B-rated acting. So, you know, it's mostly just a bunch of green screen standing around and, you know, but I, I she's get, she gets my endorsement. That's the whole point that I'm just trying to bring up to you guys. I, I definitely think she would be pretty damn good. So I'm actually rooting for her. I actually hope that uh, she might be able to secure that role. Well, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Powerful interview by cbs sports i want to bring to you all's attention and if you haven't checked it out do go out of your way to do so this is pretty much setting us up as uh we get ready to you know kind of wrap it up here i want to go into a more lighter tone here uh or serious tone here well once again non-wrestling related but randy orton and uh this really needs to get a big, big spotlight here, but Randy Orton, you know, he made headlines as we all know last month. He did the hashtag Black Lives Matter, and uh, a fan called him out about it, you know, at the time. And uh, the fan wrote, you know, all lives matter, but the point I was trying to make, or let me kind of back up a second here. So again, he used the hashtag Black Lives Matter, but a fan called him out at the time and wrote, all lives do matter. But the point I was trying to make was to uh, that I finally realized that until Black Lives Matter, they can't get it. So in an interview with CBS Sports, Orton explained why he now supports the movement and admits that it took him a while to come around. So I just want to read to you guys a couple of highlights here. Some pretty powerful stuff. Uh, 
quoting right here, when Kaepernick was kneeling, I looked at it as disrespecting the American flag and that he was disrespecting the servicemen and women who fight for our freedom and our free speech and come home in a coffin when they give the ultimate sacrifice. That coffin draped in an American flag. I think I went on Booker T's radio show and even said those things and I believed them. It took me a little time, but what I had to do was realize Kaepernick, he wasn't shitting on the flag. He wasn't disrespecting the people that have given their lives for our freedom. He was taking a stand against police brutality. As a white guy, I don't see it. But then I started listening to my black brothers and sisters, especially the ones I've known for years and some for more than a decade. I was hearing firsthand accounts of interactions with cops that took advantage of the situation and the power they had because they maybe felt a certain way about the color of someone's skin. That's when the light bulb went off. I'm embarrassed to say it, but it took me a while, but I get it. What I said on Twitter, I stand behind it. If anyone doesn't agree with me, I think they need to do more digging. Go look at Big E's Twitter from a week ago. Go look at Xavier Woods' Twitter. Go look at the things Kofi said, that Mark Henry said, that Shelton Benjamin said, that R-Truth said. If you read what they are saying and try to put yourself in their shoes for even just a minute, you're going to see right now that it's not fair. All lives do matter, but like I said on Twitter, until black lives matter, all lives can't matter. It kind of cleans up what I was trying to say there originally. That's just how it was read out there. I knew what they were trying to, but it is what it is. My only regret is that it took me a little bit of some soul searching to see that. And as far as what convinced him, the more that social media has allowed me to see these horrific videos, and it wasn't just George Floyd. I've seen so many after I did a little digging, you realize it is tough to be a black person in this country and we've got a ways to go before all lives truly matter. I think what we have to do is make sure black lives matter. And I think white people like me, especially with a platform saying that sitting on your laurels and not saying anything, I don't think that's helping anything. You need to get out there and get in this conversation you need to insert yourself. That is what I was trying to do. So again, if you haven't checked out that interview, go out of your way and check that out. Um, takes a lot of balls. Takes a lot of balls. Uh, Randy Orton, I've always fucked with Randy Orton. I remember when the shit had went down. I'm sure you guys probably do as well. Oh my God, Randy dropped the N-word. It was like a couple of months ago. He was playing a video game or whatever. And uh, yeah, like newsflash, I've played with people who I grew up with, white, Hispanic, Chinese. You know, we all looked at each other as equal. And man, you talk about the trash talking that went down on video games. You know, fool. We'd say the N word, you know, we'd call each other the N word and all kinds of shit and motherfucker and and all kinds of fucked up shit. And I, I knew just I knew what was going on with Randy Orton. I didn't think of anything of it. It went in one year and out the other. Well, but people were having a field day. Oh, did you see what Randy Orton and I don't personally know the guy, but just everything about him from over the years. I'm going, no, he was, he was just being a gamer and, you know, he, he just got to be a little smarter next time. That That's all because not everybody is truly going to just, ah, you know, he, that's how gamers talk, you know, whatever. It's a little bit more sensitive now in, in this day and age. But it, for me, it went in one ear, out the other. Uh, this is what we need. This really helps the movement when it's all said and done. You know, I, I need to see uh, more people, more white people like Brandy Orton. You know, I'm reminded of that infamous scene in Malcolm X where the white woman runs up to Malcolm X and says, hey, I, I'm down for what's going on here as far as the injustice that you know blacks are facing, the discrimination and 
I want to know what I can do to help out the cause. And Malcolm X said, you know, played by Denzel Washington, Malcolm X said nothing and walked away from her. You know, but nah, nah, no. You know, we need more white people, you know, like Randy Orton, uh, more white celebrities. I, I'm looking at the Peyton Mannings, the whole Manning clan, uh, yeah, you know, Brett Favre. I'm, you know, I'm looking at everybody. Weird Al Yankovic. I'm looking at everybody, everybody, all those powerful white celebrities, athletes across all spectrums. I'm, I'm looking at all of them. Uh, to lend their voices, especially when they know that you know, what's going on is pretty fucked up. You know, it needs to stop. We need to start having some serious discussions on, you know, how we can get this country, you know, moving in a in a more positive direction. It's a lot of healing that needs to be done in this whole process. But at the same time, there needs to be the beginning of resolution um, at the same time. And, <laughs> you know, it's 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 uh, funny because, you know, that we're here because cops somehow that TV show always, always had life on whatever network. It's bounced around many times, but it's always had life on a network because of what's going on. Boom, it's done. Live PD, no more. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, I'm pretty upset about Live PD because I watched Live PD for, God, I think I've been watching Live PD now for three, over three years. I remember one of the first times I had watched Live PD, not a long-winded story, but the very first time I had watched Live PD um, was... Me and Tammy's very first awesome con that we covered in D.C. And uh, we stayed at a really nice hotel, the Cambria. And uh, I remember after, because I think we, I, I'm pretty sure we had covered Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I remember after we got in night one, uh, you know, she was kicking back, you know, laying on the bed. You know, I'm getting the laptop together. Um, I'm getting all the editing. I'm like pulling everything that I had recorded for day one. I'm getting it all ready so I can render it in Adobe and everything. And she was getting ready to, you know, take a little bit of a nap or whatever. And I remember I just, you know, turned the TV on and I'm you know, just trying to find something something entertaining that can keep me awake while I'm rendering videos and shit. And I come across live PD on A and E. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I wake her up. She, and she wasn't sleeping that long. She probably was only sleeping for like about maybe 10 minutes. I say, honey, honey, like, look at this shit. I'm like this shit is man. This shit is kick ass. Look at this. She's like, what is this? Is this cops? I'm like, no, 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 this is live PD. She's like, what's live PD? I'm like, well, I, I guess, you know, it's it's live and you're following random police departments. Like, maybe maybe that's why it means live PD. She's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, so we, we watched and we were both hooked. We were both hooked. I think she was with me probably, uh, I think she was probably with me almost the entire time that the show was on. You know why I had liked live PD? Because Live PD wasn't strictly about get the fucking bad guy. We, you know, we're gonna put the spotlight on this, you know, this black sob and and look how we take down and it wasn't anything like that at all. And anybody that that ever during the time that Live PD was on the air will back me up on this. That's truly unbiased. They will back me up on this. You saw a lot of good stories. From live PD. I can remember episodes where cops would show up and, you know, hey, w what's going on here? Uh, we, we got a call saying uh, apparently uh, you don't want the puppy that's in your home anymore. W what's going on here? 
Yeah, I, I got this puppy and I I just don't want it anymore. Why you don't want it anymore? I, I'm scared of it. I, I don't want it. It, it. it looked mean. It looked mean. Well, let's see where it is. Can you show it to us? I don't want to touch it. We'll, 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 we'll come in the house. We'll, we'll, we'll touch it for you. You know, we'll grab it. You know, where is it? And you see this cute little fucking, you know, puppy, little, little baby Rockweiler, as cute as I don't know what, looking like, what did I do wrong? And you're like, oh, like, oh, you don't want that. Like, seriously, you don't want that. You know, other times uh, somebody had a flat, you know, cops would come and, you know, help them out or whatever. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of good that you would see. A lot of good. And the other thing that you had saw uh, with regards to uh, Live PD, you know, these guys, they're just, they're out there. You're seeing what it's like to be a police officer. I, and I'm not defending the cops in any type of way. I'm just saying there was a lot of good that you saw from Live PD. I understand why it was canceled. I, I do. I totally understand. But they were doing a lot of good in showcasing that, okay, this is the correct and proper way, you know, that we're going about these routine traffic stops. You know, hey, you know, we ran this tag because we were seeing that this driver was driving a bit erratic on the road here. And it turns out this person actually has a warrant out for their arrest. WTF um, sobriety tests that failed tremendously. Uh, you know, we saw all kinds of, they did above and beyond, I felt, and the cops that they, uh, that they covered and the jurisdictions that they had covered. And, um, you know, a lot of cops were, were doing the job correctly. And it wasn't always about God. How many of you guys remember officer Zendejas? Officers in Dejas would get the most boring, shittiest fucking cases. I, I mean, her. I remember there was one joint. One of the first times I remember seeing officers in Dejas, uh, she went to a, a restaurant, and, and I, I think somebody was mad because they didn't get their food, and they were they were drunk, and they were just being all erotic, not erotic, <laughs> that'd be something else. But they were all they're being all chaotic in the restaurant is the term I want to use. Tom Morris Jr. I remember him from his America's Most Wanted days where he was a correspondent. Uh, he would have little cool stories of his own that he would break. Um, but I remember him from those days. He had a great powerful segment on Live PD uh, where they would ask Live PD Nation for help with missing children. He would also showcase some type of a, a crime that had happened where, you know, Live PD Nation, we need your help. Shit. Um, I remember there was something in the news that happened in the district. This is a true story. You don't believe me. You can do a Bing Google search. This happened, I want to say, if not last month, in the previous month. Uh, there was a story right here in the district where there was this asshole that had no business in this apartment complex. It was a nice little fancy apartment complex. He comes in where security was. I don't know, but he basically goes behind the counter at the lobby, somehow gets into the mail room and he's just helping himself to fucking packages. One package in particular that he stole turns out, uh, it was a urn that had this guy's um, mom's ashes in it. And uh, the guy was, oh my God, he was on the news and he was just so emotional about it. I, I don't know if the ashes were ever returned. Bush, crimes like that, Tom Morris Jr. would cover. He put the spotlight on Blythe PD. If somebody, you know, was robbing a liquor store, you know, hey, Live PD, we need you to get a good look at this. You know, here's what had happened, blah, 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 blah. It, it's so weird because before Live PD got canceled, canceled, Dan Abrams, you know, was like the brainchild and everything. He basically was talking about how, you know, they're working out ways to try to restructure the show so that it can still operate 
you know, in, in some fashion. And you just kind of felt that, well, there's no way they're going to cancel Live PD, especially when you look at the spinoffs that came from it. There's no way it's going to get canceled, especially with the numbers that it continues to bring in. Sticks, Sean Larkin, totally fucking awesome. Um, you're like, nah, nah, it's not going anywhere. And then it, it gets canceled, a, a victim of the current climate that's happening. It fucking sucks. I mean, we understand, but it, it fucking sucks. When you have a situation come about where you see this fucked up story uh, that went down. I mean, take your pick. The two black men that were hanged out in California. What was it? Uh, last week or, or some shit like that. Now the report is uh, put out there that apparently one of them, uh, it was a homicide or whatever. You know, that's still, you know, we're learning as we go. But you got the new shit that had went down uh, with, uh, who, who who's the guy that just... Uh, that just uh, was killed there in Atlanta uh, in front of a uh, fucking uh, Wendy's. Uh, Ray Sean. Ray Sean fucking. Um, matter of fact, bear with me a second here. Uh, Ray Sean. Ray Sean Brooks. You know, I, I got to tell you, that broke my heart uh, hearing that fucking story. It broke my fucking heart on, on so many levels to hear that. You know, here we are again, as if the George Floyd situation wasn't enough. You know, as as if the Eric Garner situation or, or Trayvon Martin, as, as if those examples, fuck, Rodney King. You know, we hear what went down with Rayshard Brooks. For those of you that still like, you know, yeah, what, what the fuck? You know, Rayshard Brooks, 27 years old, even in the June 12th. Shot and killed by uh, one of the Atlanta Police Department officers that was investigating a report of a man asleep in a car blocking a fast food drive through lane. I've seen the videos in question, and um, I, I got to tell you, what the fuck? What the fuck? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm about to get pretty, pretty emotional and, and, and passionate right here. So I, you know, this is my first time really speaking about this since it went down, because we were on a, you know, extended break and all. So I, I need you guys to just bear with me here. But what the fuck? What the fuck? You know, here's a guy minding his own business. Okay, you know, maybe he felt he had a little bit too much to drink. He tried to do the right thing. He tried to park somewhere and sleep it off. Okay, so awesome. Awesome. So he's taking self-accountability on his part, and I ain't really got no business to be driving right now. Okay. You know, yeah, these police officers, yeah, I give him credit. Very cordial with him. He's complying. He's being respectful. They decide they want to give him a field sobriety test. And I guess for w whatever respected reasons, you know, they felt that they needed to take this guy into custody. 10.30 p.m., Atlanta Police Department officer Devin Bronson responded to a 911 complaint about a man sleeping in a car blocking a Wendy's fast food drive through lane in the south side of Atlanta, Georgia. So now you know why the Wendy's... Got destroyed there. The officer found Rayshad Brooks in the car. Woke him up. After instructing Brooks to park his car, Bronson called for backup and Garrett Rolfe, or Rolf, an officer on the department's high-intensity traffic team, DUI Tax Force, responded. Brooks gave inconsistent answers to Rolf's questions and was disoriented as to where he was, field sobriety test was done. Breathalyzer test measured Brooks' blood alcohol level as 0 0.108. Georgia's legal limit for driving is 0 0.080. Okay, so that's that's a bit high. That's a bit high. 
Ruff told Brooks that he was too impaired to operate a vehicle and ordered him to put his hands behind his back so he could basically handcuff him. Brooks breaks away, wrestled on the ground. The two officers got some punches in there during the struggle. An officer said, you're going to get tased. Stop fighting. Hands off the taser. According to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, witnesses reported and video shows that Brooks wrestled away one of the officer's tasers and ran away as the officers chased him. Video footage then shows Brooks turn toward Rolf while running, point the taser in Rolf's direction and fired it. In an analysis of several videos of the encounter, uh, a reported uh, flash of the taser suggests that Mr. Brooks did not fire it with any real accuracy. Rolf then drew his firearm and fired three times at Brooks, striking him twice in the back. Neither police officers provided medical attention to Brooks until two minutes later when Rolf unrolled a bandage five minutes after the shots were fired an ambulance arrived and Brooks was taken to the hospital where he died following surgery one officer was treated for an injury yeah I'm reminded of a scene from one of my favorite movies Menace to Society and it's a powerful scene with Charles S. Dutton where he says to, um, I, I can't think of uh, the guy's name there, but he, he's talking to uh, Lawrence Tate's character and and the lead guy that's that's in there. I won't spoil the movie for those of you that haven't su- that haven't seen it. But Charles S. Dutton basically says the hunt is on, and you're the prey. And in this particular case, uh, black people, I got to use that line right now. The hunt is on. The hunt is on. And we are to pray. Um, Let me tell you something. This was fucked up on so many goddamn levels. I don't give a fuck if uh, the guy had a criminal record or none of that matters to me right now. Number one thing that matters to me right now is he was parked. He was minding his own fucking business. This shit about he was parked illegally through a drive through you know, blocking a drive through whatever type of bullshit that was going on. Look, I'm like this. I'm like this. Somehow the guy had enough common sense. Right? Wrong. Somehow the guy had enough common sense, like most people would. Hey, man, the last thing I want to do is drink and drive. I only got one life to live. I don't want to do something stupid I'm going to regret for the rest of my life. And... You know, it's on my record. All right, let me just get in my car and just sleep somewhere, sleep it off. You know, I, I ain't got no money for a hotel. So, you know, the the cops fucked this up on so many levels. The police officers, what they should have done in this instance. Okay, you, you want to do the field sobriety test and everything? You can do the field sobriety test. You see that, oh, man. He he he, oh, he he fucking failed that test. Okay, he failed the test. Then at that point, what you should say is, okay, look, just hypothetically speaking, you know, well, you know, your car is illegally parked. You know, we, we got to get you away from from here. And you know, is there anybody that you know that can, you know, come up here and and you know, maybe pick you up, take this car? You know, is there anybody that you know? Anybody you can call? Anybody maybe we can call for you? Do you have enough money where, you know, maybe depending on where you live, you know, maybe you can you know get a taxi ride home or can we take you home somewhere? Can we take you somewhere? Can we drop you off somewhere? Take you to a loved one or something? You know, and depending on those questions that's being asked, depending on, you know, where everything goes, then, you know, if it was a case where, he didn't have anybody. He didn't know of anybody that could come get him. He didn't know of anybody that could come get the car. You know, he didn't have any money for 
a taxi cab. You know, he didn't have any money where he could go stay in a fucking hotel or whatever. Then at that point, what ultimately should have happened was the cops should have said, look, we are not going to arrest you. We're not going to arrest you. But we're concerned that you may get up at some point, maybe an hour from now, two hours from now, and you may try to drive off. So you know what we'd like to do for you is we would like to, you know, put you in our vehicle and, you know, one of us can actually drive your vehicle. And if you would allow us, you know, we can let you come on down to the precinct. We're not arresting you. You can actually sleep in my office or you can sleep in our captain's office. Our captain is really fucking cool. And, you know, you can sleep there and, you know, when you wake up in the morning, hey, you know, we can make sure that, you know, whoever clocks in for the morning shift, you know, they take you to go get some breakfast. You know, would you be OK with that? Because if you don't go with that, then, you know, we're, we know you were minding your own business. You know, you were trying to sleep it off and everything. But that's our fear. So at this point, if you don't come with us then we're going to have to arrest you. So would you be willing to come with us? You can drive up front. Again, you're not arrested. That's how you de-escalate what could potentially be a ugly and dangerous situation. And the fact that these police officers did not conduct themselves in any of that fashion, I am tremendously, tremendously disappointed uh, in how this was handled. He has a taser. Okay, he has a taser. Doesn't mean you've got to shoot the guy. It doesn't mean you got to shoot the guy. They, they shot this guy, what, three times? What was this now? They shot him, no, they shot him twice. No, three times. I, I, I had to write the first time. They shot him three times, striking him twice in the back. There was no need for that. He had a fucking taser a fucking taser no need for that most simplistic thing that should have happened oh he's taking off all right let's get in our vehicles let's chase him down in our vehicles let's call for backup given what's going on with the current climate right now nobody is to shoot him you know we already checked him for weapons he ain't got no gun on him he just got a taser no need to shoot him. Let's just apprehend him. That's how you fucking make sure that shit is de-escalated. Would a blood, would a would a blood alcohol level at, at that? Yeah, you know, judgment is probably going to be a little bit. Lord knows, I've had my share of fucking drinks. The stories that I can fucking tell you guys. <laughs> yeah, one story that jumps out to me off the break. I'm not going to give you the whole long-winded story, but uh, I remember one time I had some fucking strong-ass uh, tequila, and I was waking my girl up at fucking 3 in the morning, butterball-ass naked, uh, telling her I, I wanted to eat some mashed potatoes, some steak, and some green peas, and I wanted to go to IHOP. Mm, right now, damn it, I'm hungry. Let's go. And oh my god, she she was she was mad at me. You know, you know, uh, I I didn't remember what happened the next day. You know, she she was good sport about it. You know, she was laughing and she told me you know how much of an ass I was and everything. But you know, my point you you haven't enough to drink or you have something that has enough of a strong proof in it. Uh, yeah, you know, your, your judgment isn't going to be exactly where it, it normally would be, um, when you're sober. So this was mishandled on so many levels. There was no need to shoot this guy. No need. I don't give a fuck if these cops were on the force for three years, you know, five, just no. If that's how you got to resort to resolving a situation where you got to pull out a motherfucking gun and you got to kill somebody because they have a fucking taser, they have your taser, I'm sorry. You don't need to be on the fucking force. 
if that is your way of de-escalating a situation is to put a couple of bullets in the back of a motherfucker, no, you don't need to be on the fucking force, as far as I'm concerned. I don't give a fuck if they ran his fucking social and warned for his arrest. I don't give a flying fuck what they might have found, if anything. I don't give a fuck. That's not how a motherfucker should be taken down. Fucking foot chase or get in your vehicle, chase them down, call for backup, put the orders out there. Nobody is to shoot. Make sure that shit is clean. Make sure your shit is bulletproof. Now you got so many lives in one night that has been ruined. You got the family of Rayshard Brooks forever. Life as they know it will never be the same. Those kids that Rayshard leaves behind. His wife, now a widow. The entire family. His friends, his co-workers. Another black guy for Atlanta's police department. Those cops that responded to that incident, their lives will never, ever, ever be the same again as they know it. Very poor. Very poor. You know, I... I don't have the answers. I, I, I don't have the answers, but it's very infuriating to continue... See, here it is, you know, just, just when you thought that the shit that went down there with George Floyd, just, just when you think, okay, hopefully this, this is it. This is going to make things start to de-escalate. We get this. To my people that's protesting, everybody, black, brown. Yellow, white. Keep the protest going. That's all I got to say. Keep the protest going. Continue to let your voices be heard. Uh, you want change to happen. You got to hold all forms of government, including the police. You got to hold everybody. Everybody accountable. From the judicial system and, and, and up. Local city officials up. We got to hold everybody accountable. I told you guys a couple of years ago. I'm going to reiterate it again. And we got to get out there full effect. And, you know, if we want the type of changes that we want to occur, um, we got to get out there and the power of voting. We got to make sure that, you know, from the bottom to the top, we got to make sure that we're putting the people that we feel best represent our core values, that best represents, you know, what we envision this country that we as far as its fullest potential and really unlocking it and everything you know we need to make sure that we're putting the people in position that we feel can fucking go there and, and make it happen at some point we all are going to leave this world so for those of us that are entertaining the idea of it'd be really cool if we could have some kids you know, uh, to continue on the legacy, you know, okay, well, when we get ready to leave this earth, how do we want things to be passed on to our kids? Because they're the ones that's going to have to continue on after us. Everything that we're doing right now, you know, and even for those of us that maybe we'll never have kids, maybe it's just not possible or we just don't want kids. You know, you also, okay, so my impact on this world What's the impact going to be for the next generation that's to come? That's going to be filling it for many decades to come. You've got to be thinking about it. you got to be thinking about how you want to pay it forward. As I always say, pay it forward, always forward. Uh, we got a protest that's uh, going to be happening, I believe, in August here in the district. I'm definitely going to be going. I already told my girl. I said, look, um, I'm going to try to see if I can take off. I definitely want to fucking go. Um, you're more than welcome to tag along. But I, I, I definitely want to fucking do this. You know, you, you down and, you know, well, of course, without hesitation. She's like, yeah, yeah, we, we could definitely uh, do this, you know, when uh, whenever it comes. Um, that's, what, that's, that's what you got to do. You got to get out there. You got to protest. You, you know, a wise man <laughs> uh, and somebody who I, I fucking respect tremendously as a uh, fellow Chicago native once said, you know, you can't change the world from your sofa. 
You know, so if you're disgusted by a lot of the stuff that you're seeing right now, um, and this really goes out to uh, those that have a voice, whatever your respected platform is, whether it's a blog or you have a podcast uh, or you happen to write for a, a paper, a magazine, you know, wh what have you, um, this is that time. You know, if you're just as furious, if you're just as upset, if you're just as irritated, if you're just as disgusted as me and everybody else that's continuing to see this bullshit that's going down, you know, with our own fucking people uh, that are being killed. But let's take this a step further just to make sure that I'm being very consistent here. As I've always said time and time and time and time again, whether it's a black person that is killed by a police officer, we when it's all said and done, we've got corrupt incompetent police officers for the most part power fucking hungry that have no business with these fucking badges that don't need to be on the force and until we fucking you know, we got to keep at it all these protests that's going on we got to keep at it bottom line we got to keep it up this talk about basketball pop, man fuck basketball right now basketball don't mean jack shit Basketball don't mean jack shit right now. The only thing that fucking matters right now is how are we going to get our country moving forward? That's what fucking matters right now. Erica Shields, the Atlanta police chief, stepping down. Good. 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 Got no problem with that. I commend her for fucking stepping down. I commend her. Takes serious guts. Takes serious balls to say, okay, you know what? This shit happened on my watch. Yeah, man. Fuck this. I'm, I'm out. It's too much for me. I'm, I'm out. Yeah, that helps. That helps the cause. But we need more. You know, it's it's funny because I, I want to say this as we get ready to wrap up. It's so funny because. Over the years, I've, I've seen and, and interacted with people, you know, you know, yeah, you know, black lives matter and, you know, blah, this, and blah, 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 blah. And I've heard these people, they, they talk a really good game. They talk a really fucking good game. But when it comes time to, okay, put your money where your mouth is, silent. Don't fucking touch the topic whatsoever. Nowhere to be found on social media. Whatever normal video vlogs they like to do, or you know, nowhere to be found. Oh, but the minute some stupid shit goes down in the wrestling world, oh, they can talk about that. They talk about other things that's you know kind of non-wrestling related, but but the one time you know, okay, well here's something that is about our people. Where the fuck is you? Where's your voice to this? What are you doing to help the cause? What are you going to have there be serious dialogue? Nowhere to be found. All right, you talk a good game, but you're nowhere to be found. Those are the people that my advice to you all, <laughs> don't attach yourselves to. <laughs> Because obviously, you know, we, we know what they're about. And, you know, they're, they're not really bowdy-bowdy. <laughs> I haven't said that in a good minute. They ain't really bowdy-bowdy, you know. But I really hope that you all uh, that listen tonight, this portion of the show, and you've been with me this far, you know, I really, really hope that now more than ever, the type of change that we need to see happening in this world, I really hope that you guys are fucking doing your respected parts and if you're not doing your respected parts don't answer to me but ask yourselves why are you not doing your respected part are you scared are you intimidated is it a case where you're not really sure what to do when to do it you know only you know the answers to these questions and you've got to dig down deep and you know hopefully if not talking about it here tonight with you all, you know, hopefully you'll ask yourself, okay, you know, 
yeah, why why have I not joined in on this? You know, what what's stopping me and, and what can I do to get involved? What can I do to help out in my community? Because that's the only way we're really going to be able to do this. That's the one thing I can kind of take away from the infinite crisis. Just kind of go back to that one more time. You know, it's you know, all these heroes that come together. You know, they're from different worlds. Different cities, different nationalities, you know, different backgrounds and everything. And here are all these people that are coming together for this one cause and basically saving the universe. And, you know, and they're all working together. And by working together, the end result is a long lasting impact where, you know, everybody benefits from it globally. You know, you kind of have to take that approach wherever you are in this world. And ask yourselves, you know, what are you doing? I I know what I'm doing. Being on this show, not being afraid to talk about this, no matter how uncomfortable it might make me feel, no matter how uncomfortable it it might make some of you feel. Me being here, you know, talking about this. And you guys have known me uh, through the shows long enough to know if I I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. So trust me, when it comes to that protest, I'm definitely going to be there. I'm going to be there with my signs and all showing my face clear as fucking day. I'm I'm definitely doing it. Um, you know, whatever I can do to uh, help out with this cause and uh, get the ball rolling in, in, in the more positive and correct direction that, you know, that we need to be going in as a nation. By any means, you know, you know, I hope you guys are are having those discussions and trying to figure out what you guys can do um, as well. But this is something, I will say this, this is something that's not just overnight. It's one thing that we all got to keep in mind. This is something that we're not going to, it's been happening for some decades now. 401 something years since uh, we came to this country as slaves. And, you know, we, we still got, all of this discrimination bullshit that's going on. Yeah, this is something that you need to prepare now. This is something that ain't going to be an overnight thing. So if you're going to be about it, you know, by any means necessary, and on top of that, you got to be willing to stay the course. Right? You got to stay the course till the very end. You got to be dedicated. That's the thing. You got to be dedicated. Um... Just food for thought. Just food for thought. You know, we never really will be rid of, but there's sure as hell a lot more work that we can be doing with ourselves as human beings and how we treat our fellow man and woman. I always say repeatedly on the show over the years, I treat people the way I want to be treated. I treat people with respect. You can start there. I think if you start there, that opens up a whole lot. I want to take this time out. Thank those of you that checked out the show live tonight. Uh, Appreciate definitely those of you that went out of your way or going to be going out of your way to check out the show live on demand and on the downloads. So your next edition of the RCWR show, uh, at this point, I got my work schedule. I uh, will be doing a show. Thursday, Thursday, I will be doing a show uh, with you guys. Uh, Should be able to do that with no problem. I'm going to say we'll be live. Uh, You know, it's possible that the show could be on Wednesday. I got to check with the missus because either Wednesday or Thursday, uh, she's actually going to be picking me up from work. So just as long as you're following me throughout social media, you guys will definitely know uh, when I'm going to be doing the show. Just stay connected. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, keywords, the RCWR show. But it's either going to be Wednesday, June the 17th or Thursday, June the 18th. Uh, We'll be back live with you. I'm kind of leaning a little bit more towards Thursday. But if there's some type of way I can make it happen Wednesday night, I definitely... Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, let's go on ahead right now and let's just say Thursday, let's go ahead and say Thursday, the 18th, 
that will officially be your next edition of the RCWR show. Patreon members, I'm going to be editing that last ride episode for you guys. Uh, I'll have that scheduled. That'll go live for you all on uh, Twitter. Uh, that'll go live on Patreon. Uh, Tuesday afternoon is what I was thinking. So probably around 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That'll go live. Be kind, rewind, check out previous episodes of the RCWR show. You might have missed on demand on the downloads. If you did not check out the WWE Backlash post show, that's available everywhere. Webcast version, audio version um, as well. Please, one more time. Uh, if you're checking this out via uh, YouTube or you'll be checking this out on Fight TV, hello, and you made it this far, uh, make sure if you haven't done so already, you hit the subscribe button. I uh, saw we had picked up a couple of uh, subscribers tonight, uh, it looks like. So that's cool. Uh, Gino, once again, appreciate the super chat. Thank you so much, my friend. Really appreciate that. Uh, Austy, shout out to you as well. Appreciate everybody who uh, checked out the show live tonight. Appreciate those of you that will be checking this out on demand and on the downloads. That is going to do it. Until next go round. I am wishing all of you all, as I always close out the show, to be safe and most importantly, be kind to one another. And, you know, maybe something else I'll start saying at the end of the show. Remember to always pay it forward, always forward. I'll see you next go around. Everybody do take care. Adios.